Hello, Goggy. Hello, Mover. Did that cut off a little quick, or is that just me? That's just you. Is it? It's All not right. me. It's I, I. You know what? I'm here. Hopefully for the duration. I'm still <laughs> a little nervous. Yeah. Um, quite a windstorm going on here. It says it's live. It. I see comments. Um, sounds like we're on oh, for yeah. episode 39. Welcome back to the channel, uh, to the podcast, to the Mover and Goggy Show with Douglas. MC Doug, you there? No. I feel live. Are we live? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, how was your weekend, Senior Gonkey? Uh, well, um, so my day job, I've flown two days this year, and I had some <laughs> sim. I had some sim training uh, in the old sky bus. So he is not a was... wide body pilot, just in case anybody's wondering. No, He's, he works no. for an airline that flies six legs a day. So. <laughs> How Gonky <laughs> is living the wide body life. We will no, never know. To be honest, uh, yeah, the place I'm at, it's usually go somewhere and come back. But um, yeah, get to work. So uh, I went in for some stimulator simulator training, and uh, it's always a kick in the brain for me because, like, literally, it's the first time every time. So, but it was fun. Knocked off some rust, um, and uh, I hope to keep the my pace of that kind of flying where it's at. Here's what the people want to know. Am did I any you, good? No. <laughs> no. Did you talk to Bubbles? You know, you know, it's hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah. So, <clears throat> of course, you know, uh, they give us a scenario, right? So the yeah. fuel yeah. filter clogged yeah. in an engine, then it blew up. And uh, <laughs> so the captain calls to the back and the sim instructors play in the flight attendants. And he just comes up with, yeah, this is bubbles. And I just burst out laughing <laughs> and they have, they're like, what? I'm like, I, I just, that, that, na that name is funny. <laughs> so Dude, that actually reminds me, uh, we need to talk about that near tower collision here in a little bit. Mm. So I'm going to add that to our topics while I'm thinking about it. Cause, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty wild. That was, that was a thing. It's a good mother a, tab go. It's, it's a seven three. So it's probably People are going to blame Boeing, dude, for sure. Yeah, we'll add that to the list. We'll talk about it later, but uh, okay. Douglas, if you would, please add uh, 737 near collision with tower. Uh, anyway, so that's cool, man. How about uh, you, you, man? Did a lot of driving. I, you did a lot of driving. Yeah. I did a lot of driving. Uh, you want to know how my weekend went? I started working on the video for this. Would you like to see the trailer? Let's see it. Uh, not the trailer, the intro. Here we go. <laughs> yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. <laughs> that is, in <laughs> fact, me. Uh, and this is how it ended. Look at that. 
That was our Sunday, but great weekend uh, supporting Battle Scarred Motorsports. For those of you that don't know, it's a great nonprofit slash charity. They do what's called adrenaline therapy. And, you know, mental health is a big deal for me. And uh, I, I was put in touch with these guys by a guy we call Crayons. He's a Marine. He likes crayons. He eats them. And um, he he got me in, into this. We did a champ car race in New Orleans in 2022. And it really helped me out of a funk. You know, 2022, I was going through some stuff. And uh, that is what led me to um, get the ARCA thing going. And then I raced with them in Daytona last year. And then, unfortunately, Champ Car has pulled out of New Orleans altogether. I, I, we need to use the powers of this channel to get Champ Car back. Because here's the problem. <laughs> this weekend was a lemons race. Gonk, you know what lemons is? Uh, I don't. Okay. I mean, so, it sounds like an organization. It is, you know, it's a playoff limo, you know, lemons limo. Uh, and Doug, chime in uh, whenever you you feel like it. But so Doug's our resident uh, racing instructor here. And so lemons is a little different. And I'd heard some horror stories about just how, like, how do they operate because they're a little goofy, right? They, you know, when they do, pen, they don't do penalty laps as much as they do like embarrassing things and, you know, they're a little bit arbitrary in how the rules, but they're geared toward new drivers, new guy, guys and gals going out wheel to wheel racing for the first time. And so uh, in their series, I'm a rookie, which I laughed at, but, you know, hey, first time in their series. And that's just how it works. And, you know, they, they brief you up. The wizard guy gets up there and, you know, he talks about and I'm not joking. He's you know, he's there's one guy in a kilt. There's I mean, they're all kind of just funny characters and. Uh, they brief it up and we go racing and the idea is it's two days, uh, but it's combined. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it was seven and a half hours, one day, six and a half hours the next day. And you race and whoever is still, still standing at the end wins the problem though. And here's the thing I have with lemons. Number one, I'm not a big fan of the way they treated battle scarred motorsports. So BSM is a, is a charity and they brought out, um, so I drive this car, if the one that was on the uh, flatbed, it's called Pale Horse 323. And that is uh, the car owner, Daniel. That's his old Marine unit that, you know, saw combat action. And he had a reunion with them, so they all came out. These guys are, have never been on a racetrack. You know, I mean, it, it it's first time for everything. And so they go out there and... The car passes tech, and then the first day they get black flagged, and they get black flagged because there's a fuel pickup problem. Well, it's like, well, wait a minute, it passed tech. And they're like, no, 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 didn't, you know, the rules say this. Okay, so they modify it, and they go, well, it still doesn't pass. And then the tech guy comes out, and they're like, yes, it does pass. And it's just this, like, they, there's no working together on this, like some sanctioning bodies might do. Right. But really what rubbed me the wrong way, you saw the intro, and this is probably going to be a spoiler for the video that eventually comes out. Uh, on day two, so I drove the blue Camaro on the first day. And the second day, uh, I drove Pale Horse. I was the first one out of the gate. And because I'm more experienced than everybody else on the team, typically at this track. And um, it had an issue, it had a maintenance issue. So the day prior, it had some kind of, Doug, you remember what it was? It was like a CV issue or something in the, in the rear end. You remember what they were talking about? They'd they done were some work on it. <laughs> They were talking about um, CV issue or something to do with one of the hubs. I never got a, um, yeah. a complete picture on it, but something was so, wrong on the rear end. Yeah, so it, it wasn't going you know as fast as it normally does or whatever. And unbeknownst to me, when they put the wheels back on, it's supposed to run 18-inch wheels squared around the cor around all four corners. They accidentally put on a old Crown Vic wheel on the left rear. And so <laughs> it was the wrong diameter is 19 and it was, you know, not matching right. as far as wear patterns and stuff like you that. You didn't have a match set of tires. I got I, you. They, they were staggered match special. <laughs> just well, okay. I so you. I go out there and about an hour into it, I'm like, you know, I, it feels a little loose, but I've been driving the Camaro. And the Camaro is a, you know, you, you throttle steer through all the corners because it's got so much torque, but no grip. So you're pretty much, you know, four wheel drifting everywhere you go anyway. So I drive this thing. It's fun, having a good time. And about a, an hour into it, the car starts fading. And we're going through the S's and I kind of get sideways and I catch it. I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, I'm feeling good about myself. And then about two, three laps later, what you just saw happens because I'm going into a turn and it just, it goes, it's, it's done. And 
I spin out and recover, although it's the worst possible place on the track because there's cars coming head on at me. And I get it going, you know, thinking no harm, no foul. They black flag me. So I come in, you know, I'm like, why am I black flagged? And I, you know, talk to the guy and he's, he's pretty cool about it. And he says, listen, um, you know, is there anything you want to talk about? I said, not really. And it was the end of my stint anyway. So I was coming in, I, you know, I'd been out there for hour, hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes anyway. And uh, he's like, well, you, did you have a incident? I said, well, I, I spun, but I didn't go off track and I didn't hit anybody. So I just, you know, kept going. And he said, oh, we don't, we don't do that here. Do you race somewhere else? I'm like, yeah, I've got a, you know, couple licenses at other series. He's like, well, we're geared towards beginners and, you know, we're not, if you spin, we want to talk to you. I said, okay, no problem. And he's, he's super cool about it. You know, he's like, I'm not going to penalize you, but you had the stuff yesterday. And I'm like, well, the stuff yesterday was cleared. I don't know why we're bringing that up, but he's like, just, just go back, get your issues taken care of or whatever. So we go back and that's when they find that the wheels mismatched. And, you know, cause I find every, it, what it started doing was when I'd hit the brakes, it pulled to the right, especially at high speed, you know, cause it was unloading off that, off that wheel. And so, um, we come back in and they change drivers cause they're like, okay, it's fine. And they put a, a, a inexperienced guy in and he's got a purple heart. You know, he's a, he's a combat veteran. He's just out there to have fun. And what's funny is I was, this is why I'm mad about it. I watched the video today because I'm, I'm editing and I had accidentally, I'd taken two cameras and I'd accidentally hit record when I meant to hit stop. So I recorded his entire session. So I'm watching it and you know, first time out there, he, he, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, but he's being safe and he's running a fairly decent line. It's not super aggressive, but it's fairly decent. And as he's going through, eventually he goes through a, a sharp turn and the car just lets go. He just spins. And it's not, it's in a typical place where if you overdrive it, you will spin that, you know, turn three, but he wasn't. And it kind of gave no warning. There's no tire squeal or anything like that. It just, you know, one second he's, he's got grip. The next second he doesn't, he spins out, he keeps going. They black flag him too. And that, all this is fine. He comes in and this guy's different than the other guy and he's super rude about it he comes in he's like you guys are out there hot dog and this is the second time we've had to black flag you today which realized the first one was me not him and you know you guys are just running an unprofessional operation we're tired of dealing with your stuff this time you're getting a penalty you know park it and we're going to figure out what we do with you so what did they do with him well after debating right race is still going on they make him pull out of the pits uh, so out of the little penalty area, go into the paddock, turn left, which is nowhere near where we are, and get the team owner and somebody else. They call the team owner over, and they make him sing the uh, the Marine Corps uh, song in front of everybody. That's his uh, That sucks. You're taking a guy with a purple heart. <laughs> I just told him to pack who, sand. Who's there for adrenaline <laughs> therapy to try to deal yeah. with, you know, just stuff. And you're, you're, you're doing public humiliation drills. And I know that's the lemon's way and everybody, people are going to say, well, that, you know, mover, why are you upset? You know, you know what you're signing up for, dude, that's not what you do to beginners. What you do with beginners is you go, what happened? Because you can hear him in this video. He's going, I don't know what happened. You know, one minute it's gripped. The next minute it's gone. I don't know what I did. Like he's super confused and there's no, there's no like mentorship about it, you know? And I didn't know that all this was going on. Doug and I were off, you know, somewhere else. Uh, because I said there was something wrong with that car and it turned out the very next stint, the owner goes out and, um, he doesn't even get a full lap. He gets into the S's he's driving it hard. And that's when the, was it the rear spindle at the ball bearing on the left rear it broke the lower ball snapped. joint. Yeah. Lower ball joint. It just snapped. And that's why the, the tire is as it is. Um, so it had an issue from the day prior that was permeating and just getting worse and, you know, probably out of, you know, skew or something as it's going throughout the day. But I just, I have a problem with that. I just, as a sanctioning body, there were two things I had one, how you treat people, but two, they weren't doing, uh, they had, they had transponders, but they weren't using them. So the, the cautions were local or full course based on where the flag people were, but none of them seemed to be talking to each other. So they were never in sync and they never seemed to know where the actual event was happening. And I'm telling you, if you're running a course with beginners and you do stuff like that, you're going to kill somebody. You're going to get somebody hurt 
because the flag people were out there being lazy and not knowing what was going on, or they were letting people race right next to a car that was pulled off to the side with, you know, no flag. There's, there's too much flag spacing for that to work. So I, I just, it is disappointing because they were cool. They were cool to me, but I don't like, you know, this kid that's a purple heart. Like, dude, you just gotta, yeah, you gotta do better. They gotta know their customer or their audience. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, I don't know, but I am very appreciative of battle scar motorsports for having me out. It was a fun time. We had some great racing, um, you know, cars break that stuff happens. That's part of racing. Um, Doug, what do you have to add on any of that stuff? Am I, am I missing something? Am I forgetting something? I'm going to do a, a little Forrest Gump. We raced um, four races with those guys. And um, of the 15 races we raced, the first four were with them. We left and didn't go back. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Arbitrary and capricious. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so you ready to start talking about stuff, Gonky? Yeah, why not, man? What do what? we got? Oh my gosh. Let's uh, start game. triggering the masses. <clears throat> the Chinese. I like oh, China, boy, man. I order go. stuff from there all the time. <laughs> yeah, so this one, um, dangerously close. Chinese warplanes flying near US airspace. Worries, NORAD. Um, it's a little bit of a longer article, but basically the the moral of the story here is. The West is getting a little bit scared that China is going to be able to kind of do what Russia has been able to do, which is project power far enough to be uh, in the Aedas. And it's not that big of a deal to be in the Aedas flying around. Like I said, we we do it to other countries and Russia has done it uh, to us. We just escort each other all over the place. But it's in their minds, it's just a uh, a symbol of China's continued growth and uh, expansion of of their uh, power projection ability, which, I mean, in modern times, I, I would argue the United States has had by far the best uh, ability to project power anywhere in the world, mainly because of the uh, uh, the carrier, the, the fleet, uh, the multiple aircraft carriers that we have. We don't need your backyard to launch our air war from. We'll just park out here in the water, international waters, if we have to, and uh, and fight. So. Uh, there's some stuff in here uh, towards the end where it talks about the importance of investing in uh, over the horizon look type stuff, right? Because they, they want to be able to see China is obviously developing uh, hypersonic, really long range kind of stuff. So, that, you know, you want to be able to see not the bad guys, but you want to be able to see what's going on over the horizon. So there's over the horizon type sensors and uh, really long range radars that they're working on mainly up in the uh, Alaska uh, area. I think that it says in the article, there's like four different uh, locations or installations they're planning on building here in the next couple of years. But, you know, <clears throat> playing just playing devil's advocate or the other side of the card. Like I said, I mean, we we've done it to other countries. Uh, so, you know, a rational thinking person would be like, well, then we can expect other countries to do it to us. So I don't I don't really have. I don't really have, uh, I guess I'm not opposed to the Chinese doing what they're doing unless like, no kidding, you know, they truly do want to come over here and fight. I don't like that, but the idea of, <laughs> you know, being able to have some aircraft carriers <laughs> and being, being able to, you know, to protect your, you know, what you perceive your assets are that I, I can, I can see that. I may not totally agree with it, but I don't know, Mover, what do you think? Uh, just to clarify, we probably should have just spelled it out. Air Defense Identification Zone is what an aid is. is. Yeah, so um, that's our, our buffer where we identify threats that are incoming in our area, our air, and we defend. Um, <laughs> you know, dude, this is not new. Right. And, right well, the airplane part might be. Um, and we talked about this one or two episodes ago about the Chinese, uh, was it the H-20? Mm -hmm. and the range that it could go and what the implications of that were, you know, and, and, and the, the closer they get, the longer range weapons, all that stuff. It is a threat. They've already been doing this uh, with boats, right? Chinese fishing vessels, gathering balloons. intel. Yeah, well, balloons too. Uh, but Chinese fishing vessels and, you know, they, they go out there gathering intelligence. They're buying land around bases. I mean, 
th this is of the things that that China is doing right now. This is probably lower in the in the spectrum. However, it's the most overt. So they're using a lot of covert stuff, you know, with what they're doing. They've got what they've been doing, but this is the most overt action, and it probably will continue to escalate. And it's it's them showing that you know. You're not the the biggest kid on the block. Now, with that said, can they sustain it? That remains to be seen because if you look at the economies, um, I don't know. You know, is is that something they're going to be able to, to continue to do? I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, but but you've got experience with this. I mean, as far as countries that you know, you go to their aid is you intercept. I mean, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. It's common. You know, this is not right. something. It's it's a common thing, but I think it'll be the first time you see this because we talked about it with NATO last week, and we we're going to talk about it with the B one in Russia, and we talked about it. You, you talk about it all the time in the Pacific, but it will be the first time where they're testing our reactions at homeland. Yeah, we've. I mean, we used to talk about it all the time. Like, you know, what are we going to do when China parks the carrier off the coast of uh, San Diego? Yeah. Right? Cause I mean, that's a, that's a huge working area for the West coast, mm -hmm. um, battle groups out there. So we used to go out there all the time. I can't remember the whiskey numbers, but <clears throat> you know what there, I mean, there will be a day when they, you know, steam their carrier in and around that area. And I mean, I, <laughs> you know, the art in the article, it talks a little bit about, you know, provocation, but again, I mean, I, it's it's hard to it's it's hard to be like you're provoking me when like we provoke you <laughs> well but it always comes down to diplomacy the difference right. is you know between it being a problem and it not is if both sides know that it's not a threat the moment that changes or the moment we get remember the incident what was it 10 years ago 15 years ago now where the p3 and the fighter uh, oh. ran into each other Dude, 20 i think it's 20 years ago. was it 20 years ago over God. over tw that happened before i was in the navy but they landed remember they yeah. they landed and that became an international incident yeah. i mean that was a, a big thing so that's where things kind of get start to get sketchy and you know china is saying or people are saying about china that their goal is to take taiwan in to you know 2025 maybe a little bit after that so that's when you start to have to worry. And we talked about this with the drones and stuff like that. You start to have to worry when it becomes a, a, a warming conflict, you know, when, it, when it's not just a cold war where it's actually no kidding, you know, boots on the ground for something. Yeah. I, <clears throat> and I don't think, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, China just wants to peacefully steam their carriers all over the world. That's not what I'm saying. I just, uh, I always like yeah. to try to look at both sides. Uh, and you know, come to some sort of logical conclusion. But uh, mover, on sure. a side note, you brought up the the P three. Um, I can't remember the pilot's name. Uh, who he, he ended up being kind of famous. He wrote a book. I read it a long time ago. Um, but when I first joined the Navy, I was down here in Pensacola in flight school, and he was down here as an instructor. And there was a famous bar. Gosh, I'm getting old, man. I can't remember details. Um, there was a famous bar down here that uh, a lot of the aviators would go to. And I saw him get in a fist fight. <laughs> really? <laughs> and get drugged out by the cops. I sure did. <laughs> oh, that's too funny, dude. Yeah, yeah, that's my claim to fame. I cannot remember his name. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, moving on to our next uh, topic. Um so we were going to cover this actually in the last episode and I, it just uh, it fell by the wayside. So the KAI, Korean Aerospace Industries, and a lot of people have asked us to talk about the, the FA-50, which we will in a second. If, if most of you know, uh, or some of you may know, you may not, Lockheed Martin was working with the KAI because they were going to, the FA-50 was going to be the, competitor to the t7 and part of it was the displays were going to match the f35 it was a lot a lot of plug and play and stuff like that 
So the Korean aerospace uh, industries plans to capture over 50% of the global single seat light fighter market by developing a single seat version of its a a FA-50 because right now it's more of a trainer. They are using it in like close air support, like light attack kind of uh, scenarios. And it was a competitor for that too. It might, might still be out. I, I don't know. But uh, they've widely uh, sold, and you can talk to this, Gonky. Recent sales of FA-50s to Poland and Malaysia have yeah. prompted the revival of earlier plans for a single-seat version. They were initially abandoned in uh, for the KF-21, which we're also going to talk about the KF-21, because that thing is like, dude, these guys are, are kicking some ass when it comes to developing and producing these aircraft. They're faster than everybody else. So yeah. uh, a single-seater, which would just be the F-50, will be offered to nations that still operate the older uh, F5, A37, A4. So who's that? Like uh, with Chile? Don't they have? A4s? Uh, don't they have? A, yeah. Uh, who has A37s? Brazil? Oh, dude. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. So, yeah. Uh, it'd be some one of the South American countries. South American countries. Yeah. Countries, um, yeah. The older MiG and Sukhoi models to meet the requirements of these nations it will be tailor-made according to their specific needs, reduce costs, or change its current canopy and overall appearance. Uh, special emphasis will be given to increasing its range by replacing the back seat with a large fuel tank. I would rather have <laughs> the extra gas. <laughs> and here, ladies and gentlemen, is why it's always better to be single seat. Yeah, the uh, F50 send, mover. Send, <laughs> they all, <laughs> send all hate mail to gonky ready room at gmail.com. <laughs> he will read them for me. Uh, and air to air refueling, which they just did, like I said, with the KF 21, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, 300 aircraft sales, first car country targeted being Malaysia. And then they, uh, with that country's already getting the FA 50. They also hope that, dude, what is tenant? What is this, Gonky? Hmm. What is this? Tenant, Tentera, <clears throat> Udara. I can't, I can't see, man. It's not big enough, but that sounds, that sounds very Malaysian. Okay. Can T U D M T T U D M. Oh What's yeah, T -U -D -M? that's T U D M is the uh, Royal Malaysian Air Force. Oh okay, I thought they were the RMAF. Uh, uh, yes, that too. Okay, <laughs> Got many names, <laughs> much like Gonky. We'll also <laughs> consider the F fifty F fifty, which is the F K F twenty one, as a replacement for its Su thirty and the Hornet. Mm. Uh, and then at present, the uh, R -Caf, Rock Calf. Has not shown so their own country has not shown any interest in this FA 50 development. Well, that sucks, but you know, if you can, I mean, it's kind of like our Viper, right? We don't have we don't export, we don't buy it for ourselves, we just export it now. That the uh F 50 or the FA 50, I think, is very Viper ish, right? I mean, the gear kind of oh, yeah, the same, yeah. and I, I think it's a I think it's a sweet jet. I uh, did it say, are the Malaysians buying this? the the two seat or the single seat or is the single seat not out yet not out yet so 2028 the start oh. of the project is this year with completion by 2028 which by today's metric in the yeah. united states that is fast that's super fast four years yeah. four yeah. years no way yeah the, uh the uh, for a smaller country man like malaysia that 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 jet oh I think is... dude you can't call them small countries man if you learn nothing <laughs> A smaller air, a smaller air force like the RMAF. I think an airplane like that is is quite valuable because it has a lot of performance, a lot of capability, and I think it's going to be a lot less expensive for them to operate because that was that was their thing. I mean, right? So when I was there, they had Su thirty Mig twenty nine F eighteen. They had three frontline yeah. fighters, eight Hornets total. I think eighteen Su thirties total. I can't remember you know, maybe a dozen and a half of MiG-29. So like you're talking smaller numbers and like anytime you're dealing with the smaller numbers like that, you lose the economy of scale. Right. So yeah, the, the, you know, the guys that I talked to there were like, we, we have too many expensive jets. So, um, yeah, that, I'm not surprised I mean, they went with, with the F-850. I think it's an awesome little jet. Dude, honestly, it's, it's, it goes to like, what's the threat versus kind of what, what <clears> you're, what you need right and we yeah. talked about this with the canadian air force which a lot of people got mad about but if you're only looking to do small scale engagements and you know limited air-to-air -air capability 
maybe this is what you want, you know, some kind of light attack. It, it, right. It's about what makes sense for your mission. You know, if you're not trying to project power, a fifth gen aircraft probably doesn't suit your needs. No. Much. I mean, no. And you got to look at, co co yeah. And you got to look at the cost. I mean, not just talking about the cost of the airframe. You're, everything's ex everything's exponentially more expensive when you're t start talking about fifth, even fourth gen, right? And I, I, I would say the F fifty is probably light fourth gen. I mean, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's got. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, the capabilities of that thing. I think it's a cool jet, man. I would I would love to fly it. I bet it is like, I bet it's like a little sports car. Yeah, I mean, so they uh, the Block 10 is a software upgrade. Can we use the uh, sniper targeting pod? It actually has the capability to do BVR, beyond visual range, air to air missions, carrying the AIM 120. It's got an wow. ESA radar. Wow. <laughs> really? So, okay, yeah, on 15 May 2023. <clears throat> now, this is Wikipedia, so, you know. Uh, KAI chose the Phantom Strike among two candidates, Raytheon Phantom Strike and Northrop Grumman's AN APG 83, which are being considered as the ESA radar for the FA 50 Block 20. Uh, the Phantom Strike, which also be used in the Block 2 version, weighs 150 pounds. Dude, the nose authority on this thing's got to wow. be incredible. Yeah, I bet it's yeah. fun. Man. I bet it's fun. I mean, it's a fly by wire <laughs> system. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's got the radar, radar altimeter. It's got uh, as a three barrel cannon version of the M61 Vulcan mounted internally behind the cockpit, which fires uh, linkless 20 mic mic. Wingtip rails can accommodate the AIM 9. Uh, and it has underwing hardpoints, a Maverick, Hydra 70, uh, CBU 58, Mark 20 cluster bombs, wow. Mark 82, Mark 83. I mean, it's like a little Viper, dude. I mean, you know, it's yeah. got ECM pods, Lightning, Sniper, CD-97. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the AIM-120, uh, but it has provisions for the Python. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so. Oh, that's scary. Uh, and you'll love this one, Gonky, as a Navy man. It will have the ASRAM medium and short-range air-to-air missiles available for integration on the future KFX. <clears throat> I mean, it sounds like a full-up multi-role. <laughs> so, uh, operational yeah. history, uh, the Rock Af, Indonesia, Iraq, Iraq, Philippines, they fly Thailand, in. who, Iraq? Iraqi Air Force, yeah. Uh, well, it was a negotiating, uh, and then uh, they reopened the lead-in fighter jet for 24, which TA-50 competed. It was announced the Iraqs. Oh, they did, 24 aircraft, FA-50. Uh, however, they weren't flown until June 2022. Hmm. Um, and then Philippines, Thailand, Poland, Malaysia, Egypt is on the list and Senegal, man, when we hit it big, put us, put us on the list for one, dude, there's all <laughs> like the whole possible list. Um, the well, TF 50 a was on the contenders for the U S air force advanced tactical trainer program export hundred to 400. And that's what it is, dude. That's perfect. Yeah. That's what you need. That's your IFF. I mean, if you're if you're making sorry, views are our own and do not represent the DOD, but <laughs> of course they I'm are. I'm just saying that sounds awesome. Yeah, that well, it was in the running, right? It didn't it didn't win, but yeah. Um so the F fifty is a proposed single seat multi role fighter variant. In twenty sixteen it was canceled in favor of the KF twenty one, but in twenty twenty four the designing of the variant it was restarted. Uh, Indonesia has a T-50 for the Indonesian Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, dude, I'll tell you what, um, that's pretty cool. A lot yeah. of them just bought them as trainers, but, dude, that's a good capability, you know, to have. Well, it's, I mean, that's the, dude, that's the multi of multi role, right? So, yeah, you can yeah. use it as a trainer, but guess right. what? If bullets start flying, it's like, okay, school's over. Yeah. Put the hard points on. Put the hard points yeah. on. Yeah, uh, you know, here, here we go. They shoot back, boys and girls. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. I, I mentioned it last week. Right back in the day, the Navy used the TA four. Right. I mean, they they used it for training, and then guys would go straight over to the A four rag <laughs> to, yeah. to learn how to you know shoot the real stuff off of it. So it's not a bad it's not a bad uh, plan, really. I mean, think yep. about it. All your maintenance and all your logistics and systems is uh, streamlined for the training part and even Dude, some of the even the operational. 
I am a fan of buying more jets. Like mm-hmm. I think numbers of, you know, medium capability is, is better than few high capability. You know, you, well, you need a mix, you know, you need, you need a mix, you know, you need the, you need the workhorse and you need the elite and then somewhere in between. Um, but with technology, the way it is, you know, if you can 150 pound ESA, I mean, dude, you can put an ESA in a T38, you know I mean? Well, right. You know, it's, well, it's not, you know, you say numbers matter. They do because 15 plus years ago when I was a young yeah. Hornet pilot and back then our, um, uh, airplanes and weapons were quite a bit, uh, better than Chinese, but they had the numerical advantage. And that's one of the things we were afraid of. Right. You know, yeah. no, so 100%. I mean, it, it didn't matter if we were better, you know, like a hundred of them are coming at you and you got, you know, six missiles. <laughs> so, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Uh, we got a couple things from the audience. Uh, Andre says, okay. awesome. Greetings from Brazil. We were Thanks, just talking man. about you, Brazil. Thanks, man. It's awesome. Much respect for Brazil. Uh, Zippers forever says that's it. Lieutenant Shane Osborne is yes. the person that made you famous, Gonky. And it was in Trader John's, which is no longer open. It was in Trader <laughs> John's. I'll I'll never forget him and his girlfriend or wife was there, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's Osborne, the P three guy." And like literally a minute later, there's a full on brawl. Gonky, like, you probably cyber bullied somebody, and that's why the fight happened. <laughs> Dude, this is before the cyber existed. There was no cyber. You so just r- real life bullied him. Just in person, I just looked at him. He did. I was, yeah, I was, exactly. You bullied with your uh, <laughs> Blue Rex 03 says, Gonky, is that a bottle breacher on the shelf behind you? You no. do have a bottle breacher. Where's the uh, one that says Gonky? I, I, it was given to you by a fan. And yeah, the 20 mic mic. Yeah, where'd that one go? I think that's it, isn't it? You can't get up because we're in the middle. I can't of get up. Bit. People make fun of my pants. Yeah, he's not wearing <laughs> pants. Junkie says, Canadian <laughs> Hornet dude here. You can tell by the snowmobile. I came to politely disagree about being a small country. <clears throat> Canada's you know, a Canadian huge country. Polite, politely disagree. <laughs> uh, yeah, Junkie, I appreciate that, man. I man, I got politely told to pack sand. I, I offered a guy some money to buy his trailer park, and he was from Canada. And he pol- The nicest rejection I've ever gotten. But anyways, Canada is a huge country, but uh, yeah, they have a smaller fighter force, right? <laughs> Gonky, you're gonna keep stepping in it every show. Well, yeah. you just call Malaysia small. Like, what is it with you? Like, is there some kind of size envy with these countries that you just we gotta get you a thesaurus? Dude, I'm I'm I'm, I'm Asian. I have size envy. Come on. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't call them small, dude. They get mad. What in the comments? I, I'm getting angry comments on my videos because they're calling them small. I love Canada, the mm-hmm. people. Oh, Canada. I do, man. Operation Canadian Bacon. Ethan says, FA-50 sounds like the result of the (laughs) Dos Gringos song. (laughs) Wish I had a gun like the A-10. He doesn't have a 30 mic mic or eight Amrams. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about all that. Uh, All right. Moving on. Gonky. Hmm. We wanted to talk about uh, keeping up relations. Yes, I know the finger. (laughs) Yeah, U.S. Air Force B-1 bombers on a mission over the Barents Sea got intercepted by a uh, MiG-31. So I, it's not. I mean, we've we've been talking about you know the Adas and stuff, but it's not common, I guess, to, uh, for them to come out and intercept us. Uh, but you know, the bone got intercepted. And I thought I thought this article says a MiG-31, but I read another one. It was a, it was a flanker, Su thirty. I I read Mig thirty one, but really? perhaps there's another one. Yeah, I, and the reason I'd read Mig thirty one is because there was like a a contingent article next to it, you know, that was like Mig thirty one, the aircraft that the Russians just can't get rid of because they keep <laughs> using it for everything. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's, a, it's an insane interceptor, but. Yeah, it's kind of a short article, right? They launched a B-1, some tankers to get this thing over. And uh, the Russians came out and inter- intercepted it. But you always come back to it's nothing new. I mean, we would <laughs> we would do the the, the same thing. Uh, and I think everybody's seen the the flanker videos intercepting uh, P-8s and, you know, the the close calls, the, the you know, the, the, the close calls that the fighter pilots are doing to the um, 
to the maritime guys, but um, I mean, I don't know, Mover. What do you think? I mean, I, I, the game, it's a cat and mouse game, right? 100%. I mean, 100%. I mean this I mean, is I mean, just long, the way of. Yeah, I mean, as long as you don't crash into them like they did the P3. Um, I think the bigger news story is the B1 being there. Uh, yes and no. I mean, again, it's it's the it's the game of cat and mouse, right? I mean, yeah, projection of power. I mean, it's one v one. They right? should have sent up like their one of their 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 B one ski. Yeah, and just I, they could fight it out. I uh, one of my IPs that Vance was a B one guy. I think he said the G limit was like three Gs in the B one, so it would be a very leisurely as, <laughs> as two circle pretty fight much like us at our age right <laughs> you know yeah, very uh, gentlemanly yeah, yeah like, exactly right, cool. we're going one circle and it's, it's four miles now what would have made this story uh headline worthy replace the one with a two <laughs> you know yeah i then mean if they like, could have done that right you know? um but you know going back to let's fight them out that movie exists, and it's a documentary with Clint Eastwood. What? Yeah. Which movie? Firefox. Not a B one fighting a uh, well, blackjack. It's a, it's a Russian bomber ish, fighter ish bomber with rear facing missiles uh, fighting okay. another fighter ish bomber. <laughs> Gentlemen's agreement that, between I, the Americans I, and the Ruskin Ruskies. I, I would consider that more of an interceptor, wouldn't you? It's big airplane. It is big, yeah. It's big airplane. I mean, yeah. you know, a lot, man. A lot of the interceptors back then were big because they. That is true. That is. True. I am a Viper guy, so everything's yes. a bomber to me. So, yeah. uh, why, dude, why are you hung up on size? Come on, man. I'm I mean, trying I, to call it big. Why are you you're trying to call it small? You're, you're going just, back to call, it, so to speak. You're blanket, so, so hung up on. <laughs> all right, we've off the rails. We go. Uh, um yeah i don't have anything else to add about that because yeah i i, I mean, just think you know people they write stories about it i think to try to like sensational like, look what russia's doing but well, it's like eh, well let me ask you since you've been in the situation you're a b1 guy what are you what are you thinking well being a Order. being that it was a mig 21 or MiG sorry, 31. 31 coming at yeah. you i wouldn't be surprised if they knew they got to point out and they're like, Hey, just maintain straight and level, you know, Heads it's up. all probably brief. They probably knew from the yeah. beginning. Right. You think. That... I, and I didn't realize this, but you know, they had the tankers with them and stuff, but apparently the, the, the tanker radar can pick up fighter sized targets. Really? I don't know, I don't know what ranges I was talking. They with... have a TCAS. That's it. They don't <clears throat> have a radar, huh? They do. They use a weather radar. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I was talking with some KC10 uh, guys. We're gonna uh, get a, a text from. I know exactly where we're gonna get a text from. That's gonna explain <laughs> it all to us here. In a minute. And uh, yeah, because they were telling me about how uh, gnarly the Prowler was, and I'm like, and they were talking about like the Prowler joint and how they, and I'm like, how could you guys see him? They're like, well, you could see him on radar. I'm like, you guys have a radar. Now maybe this is another sea snakes. Sea snakes? Yeah. This might be another sea snake. This might be another uh, sea snake. Sounds like somebody's messing with Gonky. <laughs> Dang it, dude! I uh, I fall for it every time. <laughs> yeah. Damn it, Gonky. Anyways. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And back to the chat to see how <laughs> angry people are that you called it a small jet. Uh, hey. JP says, "Evening, guys. Hello, JP. Hey, JP. Thank you. Thanks, man." Flex their wings back and forth to see who's dominant. <laughs> Who can swing the fastest, right? Tomcats. Yeah. yeah. Pull forward, yeah. pull back. Not common that a B1 is serviceable. There's your news. That's a fact. That's why the Ruskies had to go look at it. They're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is one, not something. One's flying? Our, our intelligence has told us this. Uh, Wicked Spider Black says, where's the banner alert? Just a joke is missing. Uh, yeah. I, you know, let's do a blanket like the so to speak but it blanket for legal reasons everything we say is a joke yeah, yeah. can we do that can we just I say thought, that 
I thought last time we pretty much laid the groundwork of like uh, we're not reporting man, news. To us, though. We're, we're just like imagine a couple of fighter guys at the end of the day just completely BSing about a bunch of stuff that they have no idea about. Pretty yeah. and don't want to research because that's stupid. We it's don't way, <laughs> the natural reaction is so much better. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a reaction, not a <laughs> Not a dissertation. John says, hey, John, if only DCS had both aircraft, we could see the next DCS matches. The Gonky TU-60 versus the Mover B-1 dogfight. Mm. There you go. Yeah. There oh. you go. Yeah. Um, Dude, what but, would happen is we'd merge, lose sight. and that Oh, we'd hit happen. each other. Or hit each other, yes. We'd hit each other. No, yeah. we wouldn't be able to maneuver out of the way and just hit each <laughs> other. Because we've done that. In, we have. In just in general. Well, that's uh, true. All right, moving on uh, to the large country of Canada. <laughs> Biggest, hugest country in the whole world of Canada. Uh, and that's it. So when this becomes a clip, because I know this probably won't get cut out of this, but that's a joke because people got mad because Gonky called it a small country last time because he cyber bullies people. Uh, you are cyber bully here. Let me zoom in so you can read this. So... Uh, <laughs> This is the National Post, which looks to me like a Canadian uh, commentary. So let's let's keep this in mind when we're talking about it. But it had some interesting comments that I wanted to hit. Uh, training planes for fighter pilots are the latest piece of equipment that has the military scratching its head and leaning on its allies. And it's not just the aircraft, which you can see here. Um, the it says the Royal Canadian Air Force's CF-188 Hornets and CT-155 Hawks fly over the city of Cold Lake. Where's the Hornet? Camera bird. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's my guess. <laughs> the one guy got to be the. Uh, <laughs> So it says that the life cycle of military planes can be estimated from day one. So it's a head scratcher that the training aircraft for the Royal Canadian Air Force fighter pilots have reached the end of their useful lives. And now, where have we heard this before? Oh, dude. I mean, this is this is the same thing. The retiring plane is a CT-155 Hawk, which is what pilots fly before they graduate to the CF-18. It's been in use for 24 years. Brother, let me tell you something. If we had something that had only been in use for 24 years... <laughs> brand new it's Come still new south. yeah <laughs> it's still new let's, let's try <laughs> doubling almost tripling that number and then come talk to us before we uh write a hit piece because yeah, yeah. i mean even even the uh even the t-45 are older yeah yeah even the t-45 is old like the c is older than this yeah right yeah 30 years or, 90 or about the, 92 the c 92, model 92. the c model version How old is oh that? the c model nah c model is about well 20 yeah 25 years old so about the same well so the the t6 is getting to be 20 24 yeah. years i mean we're i mean we're there yeah. so anyway uh he goes on to say that uh the ct-155 has been in 24 years since canada is eventually upgrading its fighter fleet to the f-35 the Hawk has become outdated, but Canada is not ready for the switch. So it's halting its domestic fighter training program until a suitable plane is secured and conducting it in the U.S., <laughs> Finland, and Italy. Hold on now. <laughs> did you happen to look at what the U.S. has? Because we yeah. don't have anything either. And the T-7 just keeps rolling, rolling, rolling down. So, I mean, so Canada's like, all right, we're going to take our 28-year-old jet's too old. We're going to send them to the Air Force. They're yeah. going to fly 65 year old jets yeah. and it's going to yeah. be way better. <laughs> totally. Totally makes sense. <laughs> I'm with you here. Yeah. Um, it took, so this is, this is pretty uh, biased here. Uh, it took many years for Canada to finally pull the trigger on upgrading the F-35. Flame Canada did not need the F-35's uh, first strike capability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that ain't wrong. Uh, but someone pointed out previously that the reason they need it is because of their NATO commitments. So I'll go, I'll buy that. You know, if you're, if you're going to say you're going to play in the big game, yep. You know, here's your fair share. So I get it. Okay. So in January, he changed his mind and queued up for 88 of the jets costing 70 billion in total. 88 jets only cost you 70 billion. That's <laughs> well, a bargain. No, That's a bargain. Dude, they, they make their money on the, uh, 30 year the support end, program. A warranty. <laughs> The warranty and the nitrogen in the tires. That's that's where 
that's where they got them. Yeah. Uh, yeah the road to upgrade. Yeah. Well, this sounds familiar. Road to upgrade the fighters took incredibly long, leading to inflated costs. No. Um, there are deeper problems when it comes to personnel. Boy, this does sound familiar. About 10% of the roles in the already small force are vacant. Uh, and in the procurement pr department, 30% are not filled. Over the past three years, more people have left than have entered. Frankly, it's a death spiral. Yep. So, and, well, sorry. hold on. Hold on. We're not done yet. So now he's going to complain about standards for recruits are lowered every year. Long nails, hair dye, and face tattoos were permitted in 2022. But more recently, they've uh, begun excusing some applicants from aptitude tests to cut down on processing time, which is expanding recruiting to those with medical conditions. The lower standards would may not have a neg negative impact on the CAF in the short term. Then again, there wouldn't be. The Canadian military is usually in life or death situations where there is required would that matter in the first place. Wow. It it cuts thick. I mean, this is the politest sarcasm. <laughs> um, it's hardly a surprise that people aren't leaping for a chance to work at the military. Doesn't have enough equipment to run. Has about 35% of its membership reporting that they have insufficient equipment to properly do their jobs that insist on promoting divisive identity politics among its ranks. Nor is it surprising people don't want to enter an emaciated organization that's facing looming budget cuts has already dealt housing allowing cuts. Wow, really? Um, now we can't even train our own fighter pilots at home. The inability to plan for a Hawk replacement doesn't bode well for the rest of equipment. And now they're talking about Ukraine, where they've given uh, 220 million howitzers, ammunition, guns, leopard tanks. They also, we talked about this, uh, AIM-9s, right? That was part of the thing they were given uh, for the F-16s. Government sent eight tanks to Ukraine since the start of the war, um, even though... They said it was going to be much shorter. Uh, and as for fighter pilots, I don't know when they're coming back. And then I love the comments. Uh, we're committed to maintaining a lively but civil form for discussion. So Canadian. Here in the U.S., <laughs> we're not. We just, if you see the YouTube comments on this very video, yeah, people will go all out. So Gawky, yeah. uh, this sounds like the same old song and dance. It doesn't, you know, like we've seen this in the United States, right? Since the dawn of our careers. Well, so I, so when I was a RAG IP, we had a Canadian exchange uh, pilot and he was an awesome dude. Great guy. We were, you know, we were friends. We hung out outside of work a little bit as well. And uh, he ended up going back to Canada and he ended up being the commanding officer of, I think one of these training squadrons. Anyways, he got uh, in trouble. I think he even relieved a command because, you know, he just, he just, uh, wasn't nice enough. And, you know, I won't say his name, but he was a true professional, uh, somebody who, in my opinion, embraced not like, you know, bad fighter pilot culture because he's a family man, but yeah. he had the fighting spirit. He mm -hmm. rocked an, a gnarly mustache. Uh, Hell yeah. Yeah, man. He was a, you know, a Robin, o a, a nice version of a Robin Olds kind of, kind of guy. And they canned him. And I, <clears throat> Oh, that's how it works. I, I, uh, I, I'm pretty certain Canada is suffering from the same issues that we are in the U S regarding, uh, if you want to have a fighting force, you got to attract the right kind of people and retain the right kind of people. And their, their government's not doing that similar, I think to what our government's doing, which canary is outside the, the coal mine. Yeah. yeah which I would outside say they're the, the canary in the coal mine, as far as kind of some of the things they're doing. It just in general, hundred yeah. percent. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I think they're worse. Um, yeah, hundred percent. But going back to the root thing, where we're just talking about trainers, and right. uh, first off, a twenty-four-year-old trainer is not old. I mean, compared <laughs> to <laughs> what we have, it takes I mean, twenty years to get the F thirty-five to full rate uh, production. Yeah, so, I, I mean, mean <laughs> I would be happy to have a twenty-four-year-old trainer now. What is the that the CT one fifty five? Is how is how close to that is that to the T forty five? Are they pretty? I mean, non it's burning turbo fan. Yeah, kind of? Rolls Royce. Uh, the big difference between the Navy T forty five version and the Hawk like this, and like the Malaysians had the Hawk, is the uh, the landing gear, uh, and then uh, where the speed brakes are. Like, okay. So, and the Navy Hawk is heavier because of the gear. Well, and so we go back to our point that we've made with the T seven right? Delays are happening. And unless the jets are falling apart, you can still do stuff 
you know, the fighter lead in stuff, because when you get to the F-35, it's so different that it, you know, once you teach the basic skills, you don't, it doesn't matter. Like you can, you can have a, a gen two trainer because it, it's so different. I mean, that's how the T-38C is, right? I mean, it's so right. different and how it flies than an F-35 that really you're just teaching situational awareness, basic airmanship, some formation stuff. And then you're like, okay, you're going to learn the big systems and the tactics and all that stuff once you get to your airplane. Now, the problem, though, is where, where were the – I missed the – what countries did they say they were sending them to? The United States and, and who else? Italy? Um. <clears throat> excuse me oh yeah finland uh, and italy i don't think any of those countries have i mean i know the u.s doesn't but i don't i don't think you're getting anything newer in any of those countries no and the thing is you know when they say the hawk is you know woefully outdated it's not that the airplane is the issue it needs an avionics upgrade right it needs you, know, you yeah. can take you can t i mean i flew the t45a model all steam gauges it had a HUD, um, but it was a useless HUD. We used it for nothing. We used it for uh, gunnery. That's it. <clears throat> and uh, CCIP bombing. But the T-45C uh, much more resembled, you know, a Hornet with, you know, displays and, you know, yeah. waypoints and things like that. So, like, you know, I, I don't know what the cost difference is, and that might be the issue. It might not be cost effective to upgrade them to newer avionics but well this is the exact same thing so we just talked about this maybe a couple weeks ago remember we were talking about the t-38 and the air force was in this pickle because the t-7 keeps rolling to the right and the left which, which direction we're rolexing um they keep moving <laughs> they keep sliding to the right right and it keeps moving it keeps moving it's moving and so the t-38s are getting to a situation where the engines are having issues uh because they're, they're not making them there's no parts and, um, you know, the wings, uh, the wing spar, like just thousands and thousands of hours on these air, on these airframes, it doesn't talk about that, but I would be curious to know what, how many hours they have on these airframes. Right. Is it a G issue, which I can't imagine that thing's pulling more than six. 7.33 7. Yeah. 7. was the Navy limit. Right. So, but does it need to pull like, cause remember the T-38A, we were flying 60 year old airplanes and we had a G limit that was not coincidental with what it had when it came out of the factory. Remember, it was like a seven seven G, but we were we were really only pulling, you know, five to six because of the right. of the limitations. Right, we but had to do it. Right, and there's there's the SLEP program, the Service Life Extension program, where you can depot level in, enhance the life cycle. It costs money, of course, but when you're talking about sending pilots over to other countries, the problem with the U.S is we have trouble training our own pilots yeah. we i mean we're in the, we're in the same boat for different right. reasons well no for the really the same reason yeah except 60 years later because what we did was we didn't have a 24 year old trainer we had a well you know 2000 so we had a 34 year old trainer in 2000 when they said hey we need a t38c and we upgraded it and that was only supposed to be a stopgap. and now we, we're here we are you know 24 years later with a, a way too old airplane that that doesn't simulate anything it does it doesn't come close to replicating anything we fly so it's not it, about that we've proven it's, it's not about that yeah. so yeah the 38 simulates a jet aircraft period that's it and and so does the, <laughs> the 155 so does an l39 so yeah. does an l159 like there are other options out there but i i will point out that what you talked about because uh, people ask, you know, about Canadian fighter pilots. Every year at Homestead, we used to have the Canadian uh, uh, Hornet guys and They're gals. Great. Hornet, it was just guys back then that would come down to Homestead, and we would do exercises with them. We would do intercepts. We would do uh, defensive counter air, offensive counter air, BFM, a lot of BFM, a lot of BFM. Those dudes like to go up. That's the yeah. only the Hornet. They just like to go up, and they. <laughs> We used to always surprise them with the double Hemmelman, you know, because clean Viper, you know, you did your one guy keyed up on the radio. was like, wow, you know, as you're going over the top <laughs> for the second time, because the jet will just do it. But they were I mean, we worked alongside of them. They were all cool. They yeah. were all professional. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I would be proud to have to stand shoulder to shoulder with them in combat. So I think we share the same problems and the problems that they talked about in this, this about recruitment and retention, dude, it's the same thing. And it's the yep. same symptoms, you know, and it, it boils down to the top, whether it's the, the, the top of the military or, or politicians or whatever. If, if you as a fighting person do not have faith in what you're fighting for and, and who you're fighting with, because if you don't feel like you've got top cover and you can go execute the mission, right. you're not going to want to do it. Like, no. I mean, flying jets is cool, but if you don't believe in it, because at the end of the day, you are still signing that blank check up to and including your life to defend your country. And that is, is an awesome thing to do. But if, if you're not given a reason to, to believe in that and, and that is the job of your superiors to take care of your people so that they want to follow you in the battle, then you're going to have these issues. No professional wants to be on a half ass team. Nope. Nope. You know, I mean, whether it's racing cars, racing dirt bikes, flying fighters, dude, if you're not, you know, if you're not surrounded by the, by like-minded people who have the same mission in mind, who are motivated, driven, well-funded and equipped it's uh, it really changes things yeah i i feel for them you know i'm not making fun of when we talk about hey you know 24 years suck it up we're not making fun of them you no. know we're not saying that it's it's not an issue of course it's an issue and it's uh, in an ideal world 24 years would be too much and i said that about the united states i think the t-38 was outdated well before it reached the t-38c and you know i don't think in, in 2000, I don't think there should have existed a T-38 anymore. Like when the tweet left, the T-38 should have left. They were both well past their prime and did not <laughs> simulate anything that we had. And putting a HUD and MFDs didn't fix the problem. So I already believe that. And I agree with them. But in today's world, I I almost go back to just the, uh, the article itself, the sensationalism of the article, because a lot of the things he's talking about are not unique to Canada. Canada is having the same problems that all the allies are having. And it's because of supply chain issues and single point of failures with, you know, who wins the contract. Cause you know, I mean, we're America's still the leader in this stuff. So when America selects the T seven, well, all our, our partners will go, okay, yeah, we're in that same boat. And then when it gets delayed, just like when the F 35 gets delayed, there's no stopgap. Maybe Canada goes and looks at the FA 50. You know, yeah. that thing, I mean, yeah. dude, you know, start the, looking, think outside the box there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, dude, I agree. I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, from the audience related topic. So just keeping this on the same topic, uh, housing is Jordan says housing is a huge issue with the Canadian air force right now. A lot of personnel here are pissed about it and that is unset, right? You, you can't cut, you, you know, it, it's a, it's a floor. Wherever it is now, it should never go below. And the idea, especially with inflation, I mean, global inflation is a thing. U.S. inflation, Canadian inflation. You you cannot cut pay. Like, no way, man. No way. That's unfathomable. Fathomable. Yeah, that um, that's like a blue on blue. Yeah, 100%. That's a blue yeah. on blue, and that's not good. Not cool. There are things outside of your control, like service life of an aircraft. You know, maybe you didn't plan. Maybe things outside of your control happen. But this is one of those things that you just you can't you cannot allow. And then um, Trekman one says, Gonky, there's actually is a town called Cold Lake that borders the Lake of Cold Lake. The Canadian Forces Base CFB Cold Lake is beside the town of Cold Lake. Have I said yeah. Cold Lake enough? It sounds like a it sounds like a real sunny place. <laughs> Yeah, it does not sound warm. It's probably, it could be a very tropical location. We don't know. Maybe. It's a big lake, though, Mover. It's a big one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Let's get some, uh, let's get off this topic. And um, Freediver says, cyberbullying is a myth on your side, Gonky. I'm not going to say <laughs> suck it, Flexi. It's hilarious. <laughs> Dude, you've got the perfect scam going where they, you've got both of them arguing with super chats. That's the I way to do it. it. See, I don't have to bully, man. They're, Speaking of bullies, <clears throat> you bullied the poor man with the snowmobile. Donkey, I'm sorry, man. I love Canadians and Canada. It's a beautiful country. I just, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, just being honest, man. A lot of actresses are from Canada. I'm trying to think of a. Dude, there's all kinds of good stuff in Canada. Yeah. Are snowmobiles still two, two strokes, Gonky? 
No. Those uh, are your that's, people. A, that's a good question. I don't think they are, man. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, hey, Gonky. Hmm. You ready to talk about the next thing? Oh, my God. Hmm. I got usurped. <clears throat> yeah. Boeing is well, building Super Hornets because of the same thing we just talked about. Yeah, there's a great, great lead in, right? <laughs> so it doesn't say it in this article, but you know, the slow roll, the F-35 and basically, right. Everybody's everybody's struggling with a, with a fighter gap. Well, Boeing, I'm sorry, the Navy just put in an order for, uh, some more super Hornets. So the block three top of the line and it, the, the good thing is it brings the production line out to, uh, 2027. So the Navy's going to get, uh, shoot how many was it 17 of them so about a squadron and a half uh and a billion and a half dollars which blows my mind that you can look out on the ramp of a navy squad and be like wow that's a billion dollars worth of worth of airplanes out there but <clears throat> but yeah so uh, i think it's a good move on the navy's part uh we talked a little bit about it last week about you know hey they stopped okay the faxx we're going to stop the putting money to, to this right now. We're going to focus on some of the problems that we currently have, which a lot of it is because the Navy also has ships. Shocker. Uh, you know, they're just trying to manage their resources better. And I think, I think the Navy, because it's smaller, has always been a little bit better at lead turning fiscal issues. I'm not saying they're perfect by any stretch, but you know, this kind of proves my point, you know, Hey, we're never going to buy any more super hornets. Lines going to closed, right? Well, you know, an order of 17 uh, keeps it open. And that just keeps what that does is that keeps the Navy, the Navy's options open. So any further delays in F-35, um, you know, they'll be able to at least fill the void. And I can't, I've had a couple of people send me some messages. I don't personally believe the F-35 is the replacement for the Super Hornet. Uh, I wasn't around as a Hornet pilot when I, you know, when they started bringing them into the fleet. But I think the idea the whole time has been, you know, you'll have two variants, Super Hornet and F-35 on the deck. So um, this thing's going to be flying for a lot longer, man. Uh, they, I mean, you can read through it. It's got all kinds of, I mean, top of the line, you know, all the data link stuff, all the, the latest and greatest AESA, you know, it's even talk about an Erst. The, these are going to be some really powerful, powerful jets. I mean, not not fifth gen per se, but um, dude, the Super Hornet is is a is a strong candidate. So I I don't know, Mover. What do you think? Uh, good move on the Navy buying another seventeen, keeping the line open. Uh, here's uh, my conspiracy theory for this. Oh boy, it was done for Tom Cruise. <laughs> he wants one. No, because. Otherwise, Top Gun 3 wouldn't happen because they just announced Paramount <laughs> is doing another movie. And if the Super Hornet is not a not a newest, latest and greatest thing, he can't fly in the back or in the front, as his people say. Just saying. Uh, but no, seriously, <laughs> you, you, dude, I, I think we should have been buying new jets from like, I don't think the, the assembly line should ever be turned off because I think that until you have a, a ready replacement and are delivering jets by the dozen. I just think that you can't let you cannot let the state of readiness fall by the wayside. And I've, I've said that about the F 16. I think the EX, I was disappointed that we stopped by now. Granted money is always a thing, but it's the economies of scale, right? The more you buy the cheaper, the unit cost. And, uh, we talked about this, uh, now cover your ears, Gonky, because this is going to be a sensitive topic, but the Kuwaiti Block 3, <sighs> we, we talked about that with it keeping the assembly line going, and then immediately after, we were talking about India not wanting to buy it because they right. went uh, a different direction. So this almost sounds like the U.S. government going, hey, we want to keep this thing going. Why don't you give us you know, a squadron? I'm surprised to hear that 17 jets is is a squadron and a half on a small Air Force squadron of 18, 18 PAA. So 18 jets is about a small squadron and like, you know, 20 plus is a bigger squadron. So it's interesting. Was it 12? Is 12, 12. like normal? 12, yeah. Yeah. So that gives you a squadron plus spares. And where do you think, like if you were, I mean, 
where do you think half and half do they integrate you know because it's obviously not going to be a full squadron no so back when i was a super hornet ip a lot of the new jets came to the rag actually really now back then we were uh transitioning squadrons right so uh we would get all their jets and which was wonderful because i flew a ton of brand new super hornets and they were amazing and then once the the whole the squadrons would roll through they get their quals and then we yeah. would ble bleed a couple but as they would leave we would get new ones i don't know uh if that's going to be the case with with these um yeah you know, because I don't think and I, I I'm not smart on it, uh, but as far as the uh, block two and three, the, the you know, the differences, I don't know if that requires, you know, heading back to the to the rag at all. Um, but I don't know, man, uh, they might roll them through uh, this, the schoolhouse there and then just, you know, flow them onesies, twosies in the in the squadrons that need them. Um, is this yeah, a block three? Is that what this supposed is? supposed to be? Yeah, that's what it says. And they are like. So a U.S. version, so as super yeah, as it'll get. Yeah, wow. yeah, these will be the latest and greatest. You know, Big the motors a lot like the. Well, they only have one motor. <laughs> it's the what mild mean? motor. Oh, they didn't. So, uh, way back, like 10, 12 years ago, uh, they pitched a like an EPE engine, kind of like the Legacy motor had. Yeah, but. I, I don't know. It didn't get any traction. Nobody bought it, which I, I think the super Hornet needs the EP engine, but um, this is how, you know, fighter pilots aren't in charge of this, right? Stuff because there's no fighter pilot be like, give us a small engine. Yeah. I want the economy version. No, no. they're going to be like double yeah. the thrust. Yeah. It's like, it's like being like, <laughs> do you want the V six or do you want the Hellcat? It's like, ah, uh, let me think about it. No, there's no thing. Hellcat. Give yeah. me the Hellcat, dude. <laughs> yeah. I want gas mileage. I'll buy a minivan. Yeah. Uh, there's tankers available, right? <laughs> yeah. This thing can be a tanker. Uh, yeah, no, that's interesting. And so I guess the question is in Top Gun three, will he be throwing a new name tops in the trash or is it the same one? <laughs> you know what? Yeah, that's funny, man. I don't know. Uh, maybe it'll be two of them that are sewn together. You'll have, to, you'll have to have a five gallon. You'll have to have a the five upgrade. gallon. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that cuts down on production costs when you use the same natops to throw in the trash at every movie. Yeah, I don't know. I dude, I think it's a great move uh, on the Hell yeah. part. I oh, I personally yeah. think the Marines should buy a ton of them because the no, as that was the Hornet. I think the Marines actually really wanted, but I digress. Well, you know, I think Canada buying, should buy it. I, Dude, I think Canada should buy it. Well, I mean, if you keep buying them, you know, you got these older jets that, you know, different earlier lots, you can shuffle them off to the Marines that are losing their legacy yeah. Hornets, you know? I mean, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, uh, cool. Well, thank you for your insights on that, honorable gonky. Uh, Cal <laughs> says, heard the CEO of Boeing is going to resign. Yeah, I, I, there's a shakeup and at the end of the year right that's the he's like i resign at the end of the later year. well and dude they're under investigation so uh, i we, we're not covering this but alaska is under investigation with the united. feds yeah. uh, well no 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 united is faa so there's like hey you can't do check rides and and upgrade people and stuff like that but the alaska thing has become a criminal investigation and people have been notified that there may be a possible criminal investigation to the door popping off, which to me seems a little extreme because we usually don't do no with Alaska. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, it seems a little extreme to me because in the U S typically we don't do that. You know, that's, that's a lot of foreign countries do that when, when there's some kind of mishap that, you know, they'll look at criminal charges and actually put people in jail yeah. for yeah, usually when people die, this is even unusual. I mean, we'll see what happens, but I just thought that was interesting that Alaska, meanwhile, United, you know, they're, they're under a lot of scrutiny because they're not, it's not just onesie twosies. They've been having a lot of problems in the news. I think, uh, there's, there's so much uh, like, ah, oh, Boeing, you know, doors falling off, wheels falling mm -hmm. off. I think there's so much of that. Like I, I read an article today where like people are, or one of the, was it kayak? One of the platforms has like, you know, S the the no Boeing select oh select no no <laughs> aircraft yeah. select Airbus only right yeah I well. mean like that 
you know, uh, that's in my mind, that's the media kind of oh, 100%. Know, feed, feeding the fire 100%. and the frenzy, right? It's like, oh, okay, guys, look, I, you know, we get it. There's some bad apples out there, but you know, yeah. Well, not only are they doing that, but now they're doing stupid stuff like, you know, Donkey Airlines Flight 69 return to the gate. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, that's what yeah. happens. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is not new. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, yeah, exactly, man. I, I opened up the news and was like, Southwest 737 returns after bird strike. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and? I don't know, man. We've got... uh. Uh oh, and she's early. She is early, man. M must have been. <laughs> she had a rough weekend. She misses <laughs> me. T time zone change there, Luna. Yeah, she misses me. Like, <laughs> she misses old Doug. She's been. She was Doug's buddy this weekend. Uh, that's awesome. Um, Zippers Forever says, being part of the F four test community for DCS, I can tell you that in thrust we trust <laughs> is a thing. Yeah, you can never have enough thrust ever. Uh, and then Storm Squad just gave you $2. So thanks for that. All right, moving on. Um, Poland scrambles some jets. And in the same sense of what we were talking about with the, with the B1, uh, it, it's, I think this one's a little different. And there's, there's kind of a different angle uh, for this because what it says is uh, breaking story, by the way. Uh, and here's some uh, Polish aircraft. Poland scrambled a fighter jet uh, to protect Polish airspace during the drone and missile attacks of Russia against Ukraine on March 24th, according to the Polish Operational Command on X. All necessary procedures aimed at ensuring the safety of Polish airspace have been activated. An operational command of the Polish Air Force is monitoring the situation continuously. They're obviously a NATO member. Uh, Russia launched drone and missile attacks on, on different parts of Ukraine in the early hours of March 24, and they targeted uh, very western parts of Ukraine. Um, however, they didn't say there were any airspace violations, but Russian missiles have previously entered Polish airspace during attacks on Ukraine. On December 29th, a missile entered Polish airspace, putting the country's defenses on high alert. And in another incident, November 15th, the missiles flew in Polish territory during the uh, strike. They said that it was actually a stray anti-air projectile launched to intercept the Russian attack. So to me, this is less the jet stuff. I mean, yeah, you're airborne in case of an intercept, but this is the tensions being high uh, because, you know, they're, Poland is very much in a, you know, you better not because they're worried that, you know, Russia wins in ukraine and turns around and says you're next buddy but i don't think i think they know that their bargaining position is a little bit stronger um uh, just with, with how they're they're posturing but they just want to keep their country safe you know and, and those fighter pilots are going up there and they're ready to answer the call if they need to uh to go intercept whatever happens because they just have to be ready i mean there's there's no other option especially with some of the the rhetoric and the um escalated tensions um as the war progresses and they're you know they're talking about different scenarios that are not good for escalating the war i mean even look at the french you know they're even talking about you know what are, what's next yeah. what do you think yeah i mean right the location of poland i mean they're kind of i mean you're they're, they're there right and it, i mean you hit the nail on the head man <clears throat> any country if you're any country with an air force and you know somebody else uh rolls up near your territory you're gonna you're going to send something up. Right. And it's not, it's not hostile intent. Right. But it's, uh, it's, it's more of a presence thing of, Hey, I see you. I know you're here. And guess what? I can come out and say hi. And that, yeah. you know, that is a form of uh, deterrence. Right. Cause now both sides know, okay, they can see me coming. They yeah. come out here and meet me. They can probably meet me further out if need be. So, you know, stuff like this, especially given the situation there is, is we can expect, probably more of it to happen and just hopefully it just stays you know friendly yeah i think poland would like to make it known that they're not just gonna yeah accept course. it it's it's not going to go the way they think it's gonna go on the russian side if they do try to advance in that yeah direction. well 100 percent, like you said i mean they're you know they're uh, proud fighter pilots of their country and they yeah. they want that posture of like listen you're not gonna you're not gonna bully us 
we see you, we're coming up to meet you. You know, here yeah. we are. So well, and they're not meeting things. They're just up there to in case they have to shoot down a cruise missile or a drone or something like that, which right. Shooting down a drone, you know, I mean, depending on the size of the thing is that's tough, man. <clears throat> right, but, right. You know. <clears throat> but I mean, they do have very nice F sixteens. Uh have they taken yeah. delivery of the F thirty five yet? I don't know, man. Is you that know. picture are those Polish F thirty fives? I, I don't think so. I, I think I didn't it, think they did. Uh, it, it's an did, LN, the Lake and Heath jets. Cause Canada still doesn't have theirs, man. It's a Polish Viper with Lake and Heath. Okay. F 35s, which I didn't even know Lake and Heath already had the F 35. It's crazy. Yeah. It's how old we're getting. Um, <laughs> but they're, what they're doing is they're shooting across the airspace. So, yeah. you know, you're going into Polish airspace and then back out and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. You know, where, cause you have to treat every threat, you know, because today could be the day. You know, the minute you sleep on that button, yeah, you know, and, and don't sound the alarm is the, you know, that's when bad things happen, as we've seen in history time and time again, where they go, oh, Russia, they'll never do it. And then the day they do it, we're asleep at the wheel. Well, yeah. I mean, like I said, anytime you encroach on an, on somebody's airspace, you yeah. should expect, you should expect them to do something. Send airplanes up as a show of force or, uh, yeah some sort of posturing yeah 100 percent. all right uh moving on to back to the audience real quick and then we'll get to the next uh topic doug uh storm squad i'm surprised southwest has had no problems at all uh that's uh -oh. not true uh -oh. <laughs> it's a good segue <laughs> that's a for, good lead our, uh, for <laughs> what's coming up next thanks storm squad uh, that's awesome <laughs> They did hit a bird today. You know, that was in the news. Did they hit a bird today? Yeah, yeah. man. 7-3 yeah. had to come places. back. You know, like Boeing 737 yeah. had to. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Well, we got a 737 story here coming yeah, up. Yeah, we do. Uh, let's see. Our next thing is, I, dude, we finally, a kinder, gentler story for us to talk about. I feel good. I feel mm. good. Yeah. Uh, about flexing your <clears throat> profit sharing. <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you, you got it, man. I don't yeah. want to kill your thunder there. I was hoping our uh, I was hoping Wombat would be be able to be on to kind of help talk about this, but um, yeah, and so there was uh, you know there's there's Finny flights, then there's Finny flights. So uh, we got a Delta captain here, Keith Rosencrantz, who has flown for Delta for 33 years, and his last flight he charters an A330 Neo, flies him and 112 of his best friends plus his 84 84 year old mom to hawaii and back wow um, i just think i mean like that's the most like baller mic drop like hey it's been a good career um yeah. you know the funniest part about the whole article is at the end uh they're like oh it, it cost the captain a year's salary you know, <laughs> there it is around a hundred thousand dollars nearly a hundred thousand dollars that is his profit sharing check <laughs> and i'm like you got a 33 year delta captain on oh, on a330 i'm like I, <laughs> he got that out of his couch he's being modest <laughs> They're yeah. like, how, how much did this cost you uh, about a year's salary a hundred thousand yeah. sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is, i found this in my couch cushions and said oh is that enough sure I did, you know, if you watch the video, the guy, he's an ex Air Force guy, and he's just uh, he, uh, somebody you'd want to fly with. He just sounds super humble. Uh, he just sounds like he's very uh, thankful for the career that he is he's had as a as a pilot. And uh, I just think it's hilarious, like because um, ch usually charters don't go to the international. Usually charters roll over to the FBO, and I I just can't imagine. I mean, it's like, hey, uh, we got to move Taylor Swift's little business jet because <laughs> <laughs> Keith's coming in here his A330 with yeah, his 112 just, best, best you friends. Dro you drop the credit card at the FBO yeah. desk. I need yeah. all the fuel you have. I, I need. 50 I think you tons. misunderstood me. I need all the fuel you yeah. have. How Give many fuel trucks do it. you have? Yeah, <laughs> you need to borrow a couple. I mean, can you imagine? It's like, yeah, the catering, fill it up. Uh, you know, I mean. How awesome is that, man? And it, they it even give him. Sorry. Go ahead. 
I was no, going to say, it even talks about, you know, they spent some time in Hawaii. He renewed his vows to his wife. He's been married for 41. I just, like I said, just a, a really awesome story. And like, I mean, what a, what a finny flight, man. Did he charter it both ways? Yeah. He flew him there and back, man. Oh my God. Yeah. I think from Atlanta. I can't remember. So That's wait, cool. so what you're telling me that this dude chartered it, landed it at the FBO, vacationed, left the jet there they spent one day there okay they All spent right. one day uh so I'm, that's <laughs> not that's not just the yeah yeah because here's the thing man i'm sure there's a ramp fee and if you have an a330 <laughs> you know every day on i the love ramp, i love how he's renewed his vows after 41 years too he did everything like yeah it was really, it's a cool it's a cool video man like uh like i said the guy is awesome he's you can just tell he's cool and well, then of course they gave him the water cannon salute and i just I, I just think it'd be hilarious rolling up to the to the fbo i mean like i need all your ramp space all of it yeah. <laughs> it's like, i need know, so walkers and yeah. follow me truck yeah but uh, Ob obama's jet move that taylor swift off to the side i mean well, hold Dude. on now, Gonky. Here now, there's a philosophical thing here too, because I remember when I was in in doc or early training, they said keep your fo wife in your fo house if you. Want. That's the secret to a long successful career. That man did exactly that. Thirty something year career, forty one year marriage. Yeah, he didn't have ex wives to pay off. That's how no you fly can have a finny flight. Off. Yeah, that's how you can. <laughs> that's see. Kids, if you want to be a baller and rent out your own airplane at your finny flight at the highest level of captaincy, yes, you have to you have to abide by these rules. They're written in in make good alimony. choices. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> make good choices. They're, <laughs> they're written in the alimony checks <laughs> of those that have come before, but. I just, I think it's, I do, I agree. I think it's a baller move. I think it's awesome. awesome. I, I, I wonder, like, when he went to the flight office and, and was like, here's what I want to do. Like, I wonder what the initial response was. Like, do you think this went all the way to Ed Bastion? To well, get it? he talks very briefly about it. So he says he had a buddy in the charter department and he asked his buddies, like, hey, I, you know, I'd like to do yeah. this. And his buddy's like, well, it's never been done before. And then his responses were like, well, I'm going to do it. And that was kind of where it yeah. stopped. I, dude, I would be shocked mm -hmm. if they didn't tell Bastion about it. And if he didn't, you know, oh, dude, I mean, give them a yeah. discount. Come on. <laughs> he, he, he had to know about it, but I'm just saying just, you know, the, okay, we're going to put you, who's your FO, you know, I mean, yeah, one of his buddies, I'm sure it's like, they had to have go. flight attendants. Uh, for 112 people, yeah, you're right. Yeah, at least four so, of them, I think. Yeah, so they had flight attendants on this thing. Bubbles. Bubbles <laughs> had to be there. And Mima, don't forget her. Mima. <laughs> oh, dude, don't. Oh, oh, I just realized what she said. No, Gonky, we're canceled. Oh, I didn't say, dude, I didn't say Mima. You did. I just, you didn't, I didn't say anything, dude. I'm, I was just trying to be happy for this poor man that, that did his finny flight. What a way to go out. I wonder if he yeah. got an LOR after. I don't know, but you know, he <clears throat> it's cool. He said, you know, he's like, I got no regrets. I don't care about the money, the memories he'll have forever. And like, oh, no, no kidding, man. Yeah. I mean, Dude, every, every, every captain that retires from Delta is now gonna be like, man. How do you up I, one up I, that? Right. Yeah. How well, do you one up? Because at one time the A three fifty captains, when that thing first come came out, they were talking like fifty grand a month or more that yeah. they were making. So I mean, dude, that. that's they they could easily an A three fifty captains, you know, and that's the same pay scale. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if more of them had had like this becomes a thing. That would actually be pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah. non ref because I just chartered the whole airplane. <laughs> it's like, but yeah. dude, I mean, think about this guy's career. It's 30, 30 something years, so he's in the nineties, right? He had. Um, the 90s were kind of a lean time, you know. I mean, TWA and all that stuff, that's when you know that part happened. Dot com bust. So, depending on how his investments were doing in the late 90s, yeah, 9 11, which was uh, what they call it the, the black swan event, you know, and that was a bad, bad time. And then mergers, 
seniority list integrations, 2008. I mean, that, that dude yeah. has had a, a, a career. Now, could he be one of the lucky ones that, you know, he started and, you know, it is seniority just right? Because, and I tell people this for the airlines, it's about luck and timing. You know, you'll, you'll talk to two people. Yeah. Could <clears> have <throat> yeah. vastly different careers. One could be, you know, I was a captain for 20 years and I was always at the top of the, the pay scale and I was always the top of seniority. And then one could be, well, I was an FO commuting to reserve right. in my forties and it sucked. And I had to, I lost my marriage because I was commuting because she wanted to live in bays or she wanted to live here and I couldn't commute to bay. Like that is the thing about the airlines is no two careers seem to be identical. It's nice to see a guy that, um, seems to have, you know, had it, had a good career. I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about his past. You're right, man. I mean, he could have been a Northwest guy at one point, right? And, and merged. And, you know, like you said, and I've heard it from guys who've been part of mergers. I was one of the lucky ones, right? So, yeah. Um, but <clears throat> it's so cool to think. There? I'm sorry. 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 Go ahead. I was going to say it's so cool. I mean, literally, the, the guy was king for a day. I mean, in my mind. What did he fly <laughs> in the Air awesome. Force? Did it say? I, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ask the Googles. Um, I would be, I would be curious, like, because imagine, you know, if he is the yeah, his Air Force know, buddies uh, on the airplane. Oh, uh, I flew, I flew Tomcats in the in the eighties, <laughs> and then I ran it. You know, it's like, dude, what, what haven't you done? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Because being an eighties fighter pilot and then doing this is like the best career in uh, the history yeah. of all the careers. Yeah, forever and ever. Like an F four guy, he was an F four guy in the eighties, and then yeah. Go, Got out, was like, screw it, I'm going to Delta. Got out as a captain or a major, went to Delta. Yeah, had a big career. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, if, if LinkedIn is a is a reliable source of information, um, he was UPT T38 instructor pilot. And then that sound right? Yeah, but then usually yeah, they but go then, from there. Then to see what else. Fly so he was else. a fape. F-16 fighter training, F-16 fighter pilot. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Stop reading, Doug. Yes. Stop, Stop reading. If Stop that's the right reading. guy. I mean, it's Keith Rosen, <laughs> pilot at Delta Airlines from Texas. Oh, uh, dude, my hero. If now Mover, to now Mover's going to stalk him. Find him and put him on this channel. <laughs> on this show. He is my new idol. Yeah. Sorry, Oregon. You have Sorry. been displaced <laughs> by the Viper guy that... <laughs> Had a hundred thousand dollars on his couch. Oh, yeah, Oregon. If you would have rented a seven four, that would one up him. <laughs> dude, how many how many Porsches do you think he has? I don't know, dude. We need. Yeah, he now. might. Dude, he might not have any Porsches. He might have a Mustang. Jeez, I not like <laughs> the one you had. <laughs> Whoa! Why are you throwing spears about the Mustang? I, I dude, I'm not. <clears throat> Was yours not broke? Ten. Stop yelling at me. Uh, <laughs> BJ, so to speak, says that's a whole lot of b bunch of aloha to charter that. Thanks. Thanks, man. Uh, Kate Little Wolf says that is one classy, grateful, gracious culmination to a career good on that pilot. Yep. Refused to get divorced, forced to retire by the Delta Pilot Union. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura says what I've already asked. The bubbles go. <laughs> I'm sure. Bubbles in the back. Ah, oh, dude, I had a picture of Luna getting doing bubbles the other day. Not doing bubbles, like there were bubbles around and she was playing. Jimmy Hassa <laughs> says, let's not BS anyway. If you're a pilot, this is the greatest show ever, like being back nice. with the boys. Oh, thanks. Thanks, man. Uh, I bet that pilot got... <laughs> you're uh, most kids. He, he's married, so... He is, yeah. Probably <sighs> not. Uh, John says, time to reach out to him for an interview. Yes. Well, here's the problem. We don't we'll know get our people on that. Bombat. <laughs> make it so. Oh, dude. Bombat's now going to get comments from Twitter. We're going to oh, be in shit. trouble. He's going to be mad at us. Please, kids. I'll do that. Kids, ladies, gentlemen, people of the nations of the world. If we talk about Wombat, we don't message him. him. Don't message him. We love Wombat. We love don't him. message him. He'll Great be mad dude. at us. We just don't want him mad. We want him happy. A happy wombat. Uh, all right, moving on to uh, so this is interesting to me, Gonky. Hmm. Didn't Strike Fatron 204 now Strike Fatron Composite 204 get Swiss F5s? Isn't that where they got their F5s? 
I don't know where they came from, but they did get F fives. <clears throat> Great, super um, useful information there. I, so in the news, and everybody keeps sending me this, so I figured we'd talk about it, even though neither of us flew F fives. Um, so it's T thirty eight. The F five is going to the Marines, uh, which they fly them out of what Yuma. Yuma, Yuma yeah. Is there anywhere else? Pretty sure just Yuma. That's the aggressor. So the Navy flies them now, Key West and New Orleans. That's it. Yeah. Because uh, Fallon went to Vipers. Yep. And now the Marines just have them at Yuma. Uh, they use them for adversary training. And the Swiss were getting them, uh, rid of them at around $1.5 million each. Dude, we should have started to go fund it. <laughs> We'd probably be pretty close to that $1.5 mil. I think so. I mean, They're going to be adversaries. Uh, they got 22 of them. So we just needed the, two. Really? Yeah, dude, spares for the spares. <laughs> Uh, really, we could have gotten away with one, you know. I mean, I'm not gonna fly it all the time. My back can't take that. <laughs> so, yours can't either. So, yeah, we hey, we can uh, be each other's crew chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> I launch you, you launch me. My neck hurts. Your turn. <laughs> yeah, it's like no, your other left. Wait, wait, are you looking? <laughs> uh, how did you ground loop it, Gonky? Uh, <laughs> so these are secondhand F5s. Um, but they're setting up detachments at multiple bases back in 2017. They uh, are in the training program, capable of reaching speeds of Mach 1.63, maybe. Ish. Yeah, uh, but they have a 20, 20 mic mic, as we saw in the DCSs. And uh, the real thing is they're cheap. They're cheap to operate, they're cheap to buy, but they are upgraded with Garmin G3000. Interesting thing, I was trying to get the T-38s we were flying upgraded to this, the uh, Commander of the two fits was like, Hey, can you reach out to any contacts in the Navy and find out because they wanted to figure out a way to do this because the G 3000 gives them a whole range of mission equipment, uh, for integration, including helmet mounted displays, which is good when you're doing adversary work and supporting stuff, uh, and electronically scanned radar. And it goes back to dude technology, right? This thing had a range only radar when it first came out. And now you can put an ESA in it, and it's 150 pounds. You just have to wire it. Next thing you know, guess what? You got a lightweight fighter. I mean, yeah. other than its age. Um, so I thought that was cool. And I wanted to ask you, Gonky, do you think this is a better adversary option than something else, some other like, I, like, do you think this is the most cost-effective way to, to get cheap adversary air for the Marines? Yes, only because they've been doing it with the F-5, so to speak, for so yeah. many years. So logistically, everything's laid out. All the training programs are laid out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maintenance is doped out. And I actually think the F-5 is a really good aggressor platform. I've mentioned it before in the show. Uh a lot of the times doing the big, big exercises, it's this, the F5 that gets you, you know, uh, everybody's worried about the, yeah, you know, the, the big scary stuff, Su 30, whatever coming at you. So everyone's looking at that. Nobody sees the F5 <clears throat> coming at you. I mean, we would kill them a lot, but you know, it, the, you know, and I, like us flying 38s, man. Right. We would. Yeah. We, I mean, hard to see enough 22. Yeah, I mean, these, uh, what you see a lot, and I saw this when I flew the F-16, guys and girls that fly big jets get eyeball calibrated to big jets. Uh -huh. So your 45-foot wingspan looks a lot different than your 33-foot wingspan, looks a lot different than your 25-foot wingspan. And so, like, you take a little F-5 with the needle nose, nose on, it's a heart to dot hard to see now i mean remember when we did this you know we once you flew the t-38 for a little while you could see everything because you yep. just knew what you were looking for and do compared to the black dot that the t-38 was the f-22 was you know might as well have been a 737 because it was just right. a big honking airplane <laughs> and so that's good training by itself i agree with you um that it's it's great because you know it's it, They've, they've been doing it. But the other part, too, is when you're buying 22, if you've got the pilots to do it, you know, it goes back to what we talked about the, at the start of the show about putting a lot of airplanes out. 
and that's good to train against. So if I can gen up my own large for, large force exercise in house, and I don't have to go out to other units and other agencies and contract writer and all that stuff, dude, I can get good training with what I already have, and yeah. it only costs me a million and a half. So, and I'm using off because dude, off the shelf stuff is so good. It's getting around the government contract bloat and yeah. bureaucracy that is the problem. But once you can do that and just go buy an off the shelf Garmin and you know, you got moving map and all that stuff, dude, that's a formidable opponent opponent. And it's simulating a lot of good stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, we experienced some of that in the T38, right? I mean, we, yeah. it's not like our, we flew the a model, which was, uh, twin engine Cessna 152 from like 1950, right? Steam gauges, the whole works, but we had a GPS unit. It was just yeah. one off the shelf that we had to, and, and we, you know, they, they literally made brackets, yeah. right? I mean, and we, I mean, we used off the shelf stuff, like you said, we were to get around the bureaucracy and this, this, just the slowness of a general of a, any kind of military yeah. kind of procurement plan. Um, well, I mean, but, poor man's data link. You know, the ADSB yeah. and, and the, you know, I mean, dude, yeah. we knew we were each other. We could find each other in the airspace because the ADSB game changer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think, I think it's a good move on the, on the Marines. I mean, you know, in a time when, uh, air, uh, when new airplanes are behind schedule, nobody has any money or enough money. Nobody can tell you when or if money's going to be available. I think this is a good move. Um, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's a sure thing kind of move, but I think well, it's a smart move on their part. Leave it to the Marines to figure out how to do more with less. They have to, right? Yeah, r right. And, but I want mean, to, I want to exactly. reference our Canadian partners. Dude, they used to fly CF fives as their trainer, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. 22 of them. Yeah. Solves a lot yeah. of problems. <clears throat> very quickly. And I think, yeah, and I, I I still think I still think they're uh, relevant in oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, air to air training today. Well, dude, I mean, going back to the the the, the CT one fifty five problem we just talked about, you have a a trainer that you think is timing out. The Swiss are getting rid of X number of two seat F fives with upgraded moving maps and color displays. Yeah. I just solved my trainer problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And not not for a while, but dude, I mean at a million five a copy, you know, plus plus, you know, training everybody up and stuff, but it's a simple jet. I mean, civilians own these jets. It's not like right. you know, you're you're low observable and you've got all this stuff you've got to upkeep and all that stuff. It's it's like people in Hollywood own these jets. So I think it's a good move, and I think there's a lot of um ways that they can be utilized. Yeah. Same, and, man. And, and similar scenarios can be used as countries get rid of one man's trash is another man's treasure. As countries get rid of stuff and you need stop gaps, maybe it's an option. Yeah. I, don't know. <clears throat> I agree, man. I think it's a good move. Uh, Garrett says, the, uh, well, he says what I just said, Garrett, uh, the world's trash is the Marine's treasure. The USMC second <laughs> motto should be second hand. Also, the Delta pilot was a Gulf War combat viper pilot <laughs> yep and uh, jordan asked is the f-20 tiger shark comparable at all dude i don't know anything about that like it seems like it never really came to fruition so it's not something i've ever really learned about yeah you know anything I, about that yeah i actually saw it man because i i grew up in saudi arabia and i saw it right before they crashed two of them i think the one that crashed in the paris air show so it was on its way to the paris air show uh, yeah, F-20 Tiger Shark, man, is an awesome airplane. I mean, it's it's kind of like a Viper Hornet Light, right? So yeah, uh, it had, I believe, the Hornet engine in it, uh, high thrust to weight. but One, though, right? One. Just a just right. single engine? Just one. Had a APG-style radar on it, but not as powerful as the, the Hornet one. Had a decent HUD. Uh, it was, you know, uh, I mean, it was a good airplane. The problem with that airplane was they you know, the F five was kind of like the, you know, the freedom fighters, the cheap fighter for, you know, I don't want to say smaller countries, but let's say countries. with, <laughs> with, with <laughs> Let's just say, um, 
uh, developing nations. This is back in the 60s, oh, right? Oh boy, 1960s. That's all hate mail to gonky. Oh, it's true because, like the you know the during the Vietnam War, the you know the the Vietnamese flew them. Uh, you know, countries that didn't have as much money flew the F five, and so. Northrop was like, well, there's clearly a market for a cheap fighter because no one, no foreign customers buying F-15s and F-14s, right? Very few were even buying the F-4 because that's an expensive interceptor. So they built the F-20 <clears throat> and it initially it was, it was going well, but I believe it was, I've been Reagan or Carter. I can't remember. One of the presidents in the seventies or eighties opened up uh, the F-16 and the F-18 to the market to to other countries. And when mm -hmm. that happened, it's like, well, I can have an F-20, I can have an F-16 or, or an F-18. And they chose, most countries chose the F-16 because it had more, it was a more capable F-20. That's my layman's understanding of it. But um, yeah, they by all accounts, it was a very capable airplane. I think it'd be awesome as a red air jet. Yeah. But that's yeah. just me. Although you would probably want two engines. I love two engines, man. You know, I mean, I know. one is good. Two is gooder. I, I don't see the junkie says y'all pitching for jobs at the sundowners used to fly F fives as our interceptor brothers. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're out of job pitching territory. Yeah. Here. I mean, the, the transfer back to the Navy would take a year by itself. I would love, I, I love to fly yeah. F5s in Key West. I actually had that job. Uh, I never actually went and did it. Um, they actually painted my rank and name on a jet too, and then I got hired by the RMAF, so I went and did that. I'm always breezing through life, Gonky. <laughs> Dude, it was hard work, man. <laughs> Freediver says, Plexi's buying a new computer for DCS, so here's his tribute to for the evenings. <laughs> he still loves you, Gonky. Plexi. Plexi, yeah. yeah. I love it. So, Gonky, oh. Super Hornets are getting marked with drones. Look Tell at me this. About this. Yeah, so the Eisenhower is out there, and we've been talking about it. Uh, Super Hornets going up and repelling the drones. So, I guess the BBC was out there uh, taking some pictures, and they noticed that there were some silhouettes of drones on the side uh, on the side of some of the Hornets taxiing around the ship. So it's, uh, <laughs> I got a little irritated because in the article there, they reached out to CENTCOM for the, you know, like, Hey, you know, uh, can you expand on this? And I'm thinking, no, <laughs> never, ever got reach out. trouble. Yeah. You know, cause when you paint, you know, painting that stuff on the side of an airplane like that, it's, I think it's a morale built booster, right? I mean, you got, you know, these, you got so many young guys and gals that work so hard on a carrier where the conditions suck. It's super hot. It's crappy. And the, they, they get these jets flying. I mean, they're, you know, around the clock and they don't get to actually see what the airplanes are doing. And I think, man, when they come back, if I, I remember when I was, you know, when we were doing combat apps, you came back with the, the bombs gone, right? That, that job well done for the Ordies. And, you know, if you're doing stuff like painting, painting mission stuff like strikes, drone kills on the side of the airplane, I think it's great for morale. And I, it really pissed me off if CENTCOM's like, oh, I can't have that, you know, get that off the airplane's kind of stuff. Did, did they do that? No, but I, man, we I live mean, in such a, we live in such a sensitive time. You know, I could see so somebody be like, this hurts my feelings. It hurts the feelings of the drone <laughs> operators everywhere. I think it's cool, man. Now, you know, is a drone the same thing as shooting down a another piloted airplane? I don't think so. But I mean, a kill, a kill is a kill. You know, I mean, he's got they got bomb strikes on there, right? How many missions that jet's dropped on? Um, I think it's good for, for morale. I I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, Mover, did you guys, did you guys do stuff like this? No, at all. You know when. 15 years ago, however long 07 was, uh, we didn't paint. I mean, every jet yeah, on the entire, have, you'd, you'd have no more room. Right. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, dude, uh, let's, here, let's put something on the inside continued, of the gear doors. <laughs> continued on page two, you know, you'd have, uh, right. Right. Uh, exactly. So, I, the, right. 
but do they? But I mean, there was stuff in the gear doors. We was there okay? Stuff. Yeah. Every now yeah. and then you'd, you'd have a jet that had some stuff in the gear doors from it. But uh, I mean, dude, you, you mentioned the BBC pissing you off. The BBC. <laughs> they were the. Were the, they were the ones that got it wrong yeah. about the Marine? Yeah. That was not an ace. Earl. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. are they getting this right? You know, I mean, well, I mean, I, I know they're actually painting, you know, the silhouettes of drones on the side of airplanes because we have the pictures to prove it. But, you know, is it right to be like, oh, well, let's see what, uh, we'll see what the, four star over at centcom says about this i'm like come on man i, mean, I tell they are though could you have a comment for this story I'm like no yeah yeah it's like centcom did not immediately respond uh, yeah that, well that's how they they are you know they they just look for something to yeah because the business insider was re request seeking clarification on the markings in the photo published by the navy last week it's so like you know what that, you do you don't let them on the damn boat anymore kick them off yeah, it's like if you guys are just coming over here to just pee in our Cheerios, beat it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't stuff ask like stupid that. questions. Yeah, these, I, I mean, especially the Eisenhower man, they're, I mean, they're getting worked right now. And anything to disrupt morale, I think, is is bad. And, and this kind of, I mean, we were even in the red air world, right? I mean, in our, oh, yeah. we really did have a ready room, right? Because we were in a Navy space. But right, mm -hmm. we had our kills up in the ready room, and you know there oh, was. Uh... Could you imagine if BBC, <laughs> the news organization, not right. any other acronyms, if they went into the ready room and saw the kill, saw that, ask a lieutenant, what's that mean? Oh, sir, that's where we killed a, a raptor with our T thirty eight. What? Dude. Tell that me more. Been, yeah, <laughs> Tell that would front page. <laughs> Sixty-year-old trainer kills yeah. F twenty-two, showing incompetence <laughs> of the entire F thirty twenty-two yeah. fleet. And it's like yeah. you don't know. It, it goes that kind of stuff. Like it's it's aggravating. Yeah, and, and but that's what you talked about. That's what's happening with a lot of these Boeing aircraft and yeah. a lot of the you know airlines is that when they they latch on to something and they realize that it gets clicked because it gets people spun up they just keep running with it over and over and this is the same thing i mean it, it let's it didn't i don't think it has you know gone anything but let's say it had i mean can you imagine what it would have done to morale you know if they're like yeah Oh well, we we just showed that you know we're we're proud of the fact that we're getting attacked by Houthi drones and you know we're shooting them down and like okay, you know yeah <clears throat> yeah I, dude uh, when I was a rag IP um, there was a certain you know uh, leaders uh, political leadership at the time was different. And the skipper was like, you know, what? I don't have time to go over every call sign. He took all the call signs and names off the jets. And oh my God. that sucked. You know, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. I liked seeing, I mean, not even my name. I, I just liked seeing the names and call signs on the jets. I, like I walked past and I just chuckled to myself. Like, you know, how could I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, you know, it's a, uh, people sticking their nose in other people's business. It's like, you know, the fighter pilot business and the, the business of war is the business of war. And you don't need, you know, if you don't want to be a part of that, that's fine. It's in the, in the U S it's a volunteer force, right? You volunteer to go out and do stuff like this. And it takes a certain kind of person <clears throat> to do it. And those kind of people are going to, uh, you know, uh, respond differently to, to, well to you know to things i mean world they, war ii would have never i mean it just never would have, i mean with the stuff they painted on the side of airplanes in world war ii yeah. yeah girls i mean yeah anything all right um gonky we got to step it up a little bit we got a couple more topics and we're reaching the end of our our time together <laughs> um wah, wah, wah. So, so dude this is news like you would think oh what a big what's the big deal so the we talked about the um that's a cool kai kfa 50 and it's to be replaced by the kf21 but dude 
the 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 headline here is that in operational testing, the KF twenty one is light years ahead of anything in the world as far as how fast they're going through stuff. <clears throat> it says they take the lead over the India's over India's AMCA, Turkey's Khan, and they conduct oh, their first boy. aerial refueling test. And they call it the Bora May. Uh, so on March 19th, the milestone underscores the aircraft's potential for extended range operations confirmed by DARPA. The test, which took place over the southern coastal waters, saw the Air Force's case KC-330. So is that like an Airbus 330 that is a tanker? So I guess. Seamlessly refuel. See, that, that guy could have rented his A330 <laughs> and done the refueling for him. Departing from an airbase and 296 kilometers southeast of Seoul, fighter engaged in a refueling operation under the careful watch of Defense Authority, utilizing it flying boom, its flying boom, the tanker successfully transferred fuel to the KF-21 prototype number five. Uh, it's a 50% extent of uh, operational range, and there's video of it. Uh, air refueling is a central capability of modern fighter jets. They outline plans to continue assessing the KF-21's uh, aerial refueling capabilities across various uh, parameters. This project, initiated in 2015, in collaboration with Indonesia, re represents a significant endeavor to develop a cutting-edge supersonic fighter jet with six prototypes already constructed. The project is poised to deliver the first production model to the Air Force in the second half of 2026. And that, my friend, is the headline here. It faces challenges, though, uh, for Indonesia's commitment to the joint development effort. Uh, they, it's only given them 20% 20, 20 of the project's total cost. Uh, with delayed payments amounting to a trillion dollars. Recent reports suggest Indonesia's request to extend the payment deadline 2034. So money is a problem, but uh, it's the development of their race to deploy their own fifth-gen jet, which looks pretty similar to some stuff we've seen before. But mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, they all look the same. Um, in early March, they greenlit the project in India for the fifth-gen uh, fighter jet known as the Advanced Medium Combat Aircraft which is their own in-house brand um, of that. So, and then Turkey, obviously, they did their con flight for 13 minutes. Mm -hmm. The large country of Turkey. So, it's a big country, dude. Biggest that country. Big country. Very Super big. Power. Lots of history. Uh, so, Gonky. Yes, sir. Dude, we've talked about this. I wish we... Rick would be a great asset for this to talk about, you know, the initial design Wild. to having six. I mean, dude, I don't know of another country that has done this. So 2015, so 11 years from the time they started to the time they, they think it's going to be IOC and actually be, um, well, first production mod, mod model. So that doesn't mean IOC. But compare that with the F-35. Compare that with the F-22. I... Compare that with a Su-57, which still, I mean, most of its aircraft are prototypes. They do have some operational aircraft, but not very many. To compare that with the Con, compare that with all these other aircraft, the question I have is, do you think it's living up to its hype, or you know, or do you get what you pay for when you when you do do you need that much time? I think it's a mix of uh, the way the U S is doing it is way, way too much. Just red tape. Um, however, I would also not be surprised, uh, you know, the speed at which they're able to bring these air aircraft to light. There's probably problems that they have that, uh, like a U.S. jet wouldn't have because of the red tape. You know what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. you can have quality and speed, but you know, clearly if you're, if clearly these are super motivated people in countries um, that are really working hard to get this, get this, you know, thing airborne literally. And um, you know, it's, I just think it, it would be kind of foolish to think that, yeah, okay. They, they got it air, you know, it's flying, but to think that it's, you know, as, as, it's no, you're up. saying it's no Raptor. Yeah. It's not like yeah. they've, they've created a Raptor in six years. <clears throat> Correct. Uh, and the, the Raptor is a little bit different because that thing was, I mean, that, that thing was 
like a mid eighties, right? Late nineties. Right, yeah. The ATF. Um, yeah. The ATF. That's right. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, what they're doing, I think is incredible. And I think that, uh, that they are probably the speed at which they're doing this is probably more in line with what he should be. Um, but I, I, I mean, I'm impressed, man. I, I, I mean, think, we talk about it all the time, the, the, like delays, delays, delays. Yeah, delays. I mean, we couldn't, we can't even get the T7 in, in place in time. I mean, I like know, the MH139, you know, same thing. But I do think it's interesting when they start talking about when the bill comes due and Indonesia is asking for extra time. That's the, the red flag, right? Because the U.S., you know, we can print more money. And, you know, if, if countries back out and don't pay us, we're just like, oh, okay, we can figure it out. But, dude, I mean, I, if, if yeah. you're depending on a trillion dollars from another country and they're like, yeah, we need some more time, you know, it's like the friend that owes you money. Um, that could get in the way of the development time frame to continue to meet these goals and these deadlines. I mean, I think it's great that they got as far as they have right now. But, you know, when you talk about long-term production, to actually put aircraft on the ramp, that is where, you know, you need those economies of scale. You need those extra support from other countries, or you have to have your own big economy that can afford it. And I'm just interested to see it's all great in test and we're meeting milestones. But like you said, I'm interested to see how it plays out once they finally um, actually put squadrons of them out there. And then once they do, well, maybe maybe it's time to reevaluate, you know, the the Pacific, you know, our our posture is there because now, you know, it's there. I mean, do they need us as much anymore from the U.S. perspective if they're capable of fielding fifth gen fighters on their own? Yeah, I mean, you bring up another point too. I mean, all these, I mean, any country wants to have their own stuff, right? I mean, you don't want. I mean, I don't want. America to be reliant on anybody else. That's just yeah. my own prideful American, you know, way. And especially if you're, you know, if you're a, a military member <clears throat> or a fighter pilot, I mean, I, I always felt proud to be flying a McDonnell Douglas or a Boeing yeah. fighter jet, man, made right. You know, I, I went to the factory in, you know, in St. Louis, I talked, shook hands with the people that made the airplane, you know, that this thing came from my country. And that's a very, uh, awesome thing to be able to say and you know other countries want that and yeah. you know nobody wants to be well if america gets mad at us you know they're gonna shut off our parts supply or they're going like malaysia's running into this problem now with the su-30 right sanctions on russia they can't get parts for the su-30 at least not like they used to right you know so they're you know, Malaysia doesn't really have a dog in this fight. They just want parts for their airplane. They just happened to, you know, 20 years ago, buy it from Russia, <laughs> you know? So uh, I'm not surprised uh, that, you know, other countries are, are developing and building their own advanced warplanes. And I'm not really surprised at the speed at which they're doing it. And they can now truth be told, they can also leverage, you know, what they've learned from, you know, buying Western and even Russian aircraft right they're not starting from like literally nothing which is why you talked about you see a lot of common commonality in the in the at least the yeah. designs that we see in these articles i wonder from a geopolitical standpoint how this escalates or de-escalates with north korea because <laughs> yeah. you know they're they're very reliant on russian old russia i mean very old you know they're they're more focused on their missile tech right now, right? Because that's their big thing is showing that they can launch missiles and, you know, they've got artillery and, and they've got a lot of old stuff in great numbers. But, you know, they're whether they will stand idly by with a, a country like, you know, to their south that that is able to create this. I mean, right. I, right. I wonder I wonder whether it's a an escalatory thing or a de-escalatory thing, you know, if it's peace through strength or yeah. if it's, you know, Hey, now we got to do our own thing too, you know, but yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's a good point. Kudos to them though. I mean, yes, that's really cool that they're able to do that. And I, I think that 
you're right. That should be the goal. That that should be the production timeline should be that, not 20 years that we've seen of government bloat and waste. Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, all right. Gonky. Yes, sir. We got two airliner topics and then <laughs> on to the mental health minute, and then we'll catch up with the uh mm. with the kids at home. Uh <laughs> What happened here? Uh, so <laughs> right before we got on the show, uh, Kate sent me this one of our one of our viewers. Thank you, Kate. And I she didn't think it would be cool for the for the show, but I, I thought it was really neat. It, there's a there's a video attached to it. It's kind of long. Um, Australia is so beautiful. But anyways, uh, this British defense secretary here, uh, Grant Shapps, he is traveling around uh, in a they threw him in the backseat of a super hornet and they, you know, Australia has both the uh, growler and the, uh, and the regular, the fighter super hornet. And they put, uh, they put him in the back. So the Brits don't use the super hornet and it was part of a, they sell the idea kind of on like, Hey, you can kind of look at some of our capabilities. It shows him taking off here three, it's two jets. They got three tanks, maybe a couple 500 pounders. I don't know what else, but, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm a, I mean, yes, if you've never been in a fighter before you, you take the opportunity, but, um, I don't know if this, if the, this Brit, uh, British government official has any military time, but given the choice, I'm probably going to want to ride in the biz jet. Um, at the, at the end of the, I mean, uh, yeah, your eight points connected sitting on a rocket seat. You know, there's no bathroom breaks in this bad boy unless you had a bag with you, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, it's is, two ship. Yeah, the, Doug, let it play from here. It's I, I think it's, I mean, I visited Australia when I was in, you know, when me and my wife lived out in Malaysia. Yeah. It, was, it was such a beautiful country. <clears throat> but yeah, man, look at that. Is that a travel pod? No, dude, those are fuel tanks, my friend. <laughs> no, on the left, the left of the fuel tank is that? No, a, it's a five. It's a, I think it's a five hundred pounder. It had bombs on it, man. It looked like it had willy bombs. nilly flying around with five hundred pounders. It looked like <clears throat> I could be wrong, but it looked like yeah, such a beautiful shot. It uh, it looked like maybe five hundred thousand pounders. I can't remember. Top uh, Gun three confirmed right there. Maverick is the dignitary getting flown around in the Super Hornet, and then. Country X intercepts and he has to pilots incapacitated. He has to take over. That's so funny, man. That, that script has already been written. Um, but uh, at the very end of the article, it's kind of funny. It just says, you know, in a, in a commercial airline, this six, you know, a uh, thousand kilometer, which is what 600 mile journey would take, you know, an, uh, an hour to an hour and a half. And I'm like, well, dude, in a super hornet like that, you just added 30 minutes to your trip. Because <laughs> I'm sorry, man, the super hornet does not cruise as fast as an airliner does. There it is, right? It's like yeah. when flying commercially, the flight time for the thousand kilometer journey between was it uh, Canberra? Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I can't. Uh, he Adelaide. He could have. Listen, he could either have a super hornet or he could have Margot Robbie. As his flight attendant <laughs> in his private jet. Yeah. I yeah. On a thousand kilometer journey in a government business jet, I'm sure they're, you know, they're they're drinking coffee. What eating, even uh, is a kilometer, Gonky? Who cares? As the mover would say, a thousand commie units. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll but no, hate I thought Melty Gonky. So I, I I wanted to ask Mover. Have you or do you know anybody that has flown a foreign or not foreign government official that's not military in the in the backseat of a jet i so the first thing that came to mind when i saw that was that rafal where the 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 he was a local like either business or government official that punched himself out you know he had a oh, his medical oh, clearance and wow. uh, he bunted and he grabbed the handle as he bunted and punched himself out and the only reason he didn't punch both of them out is because the seat sequencer failed uh between the two seats so right. the other guy just landed um i mean we at 204 we had congressman scalise oh okay did he get a ride yeah pep took him for a flight oh 
I yeah, because I I met the Capitol Police's bodyguards. They gave me a patch. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so Congress so it does have it here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, but you mean foreign? I don't. I'm sure it does. I mean, now that's a fam ride or an incentive ride, right? That's a dedicated. You know, we're just going to go out, do loops to music, and come back. To use it as a taxi service. I don't know. That's an man. operational squadron too, man. That, I yeah, think that's one, one squadron. That's a little different to use it as its personal taxi. I just, the well, optics sold, are bad. They sold it as a, uh, a capabilities demonstrator, which, okay. Well, they brought bombs. But, yeah. I mean, they brought 500 pounders. I'm not against it. I, I, I think, I think it's really cool. Um, it's definitely outside the, yeah, the box because I, I I can't I mean I've I've given a lot uh you know quite a few backseat rides but it's always been military people like midshipmen sailor you oh, know, really? sailors of the year airmen of the year yeah no I mean Farley took Mark Greeny who's really? an author yeah really yeah yeah no usually that stuff is uh, left to the blues right uh, no PR he, kind of he, stuff? he took the the author guy wow I um, didn't know that. Yeah, no, we're in active duty Navy. We never took uh, a lot of squadrons like they have the honorary squadron commander. That's a civilian. They get rides in the Air Force. Honor Guard, um, did you say honorary squadron commander? So like um, local like business leaders or town leaders or whatever, where a squadron is like at Luke. Yeah, they will uh, nominate an honorary squadron commander that kind of liaises to the civilian public and they'll get a ride typically in an F-16. Oh. Um, hmm. Yeah, it happens. I mean, it happens. Um, yeah. If I ever make, make it back to Australia, I'd treat me as a diplomat. I'll take a ride. I'll do the, the Margot Robbie flight attendant option. <laughs> yeah. Or that I'll do that one too. <laughs> no, you're married. You can't. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the PG version. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gonky, speaking of airliners. Oh, dude. This is breaking news, actually. This is like new news. Um, we were talking about whether Southwest was in that. So this is Vast Aviation. We give them all the credit for making this. Um, I'll try to remember to stop it as we go. I hope it doesn't play in PowerPoint mode. But basically, the gist is uh, 737 operated by Southwest Airlines uh, was coming in and there was a little bit, they say, like, I don't know what the wind report was. There was a little bit of a wind shear. So they had a tailwind at altitude, but then a headwind on final. And so uh, it kind of dumped them high. So they were like high on an unstable approach. So they, they basically are, they go try the first approach, they go around and then come back around for a second approach and it's about 600 feet overcast with a uh, RVR. So visibility is being called out because it's raining. And when they do the second approach, they go around and on the go around, or maybe they don't, we'll have to watch. I, now I don't remember which, which, what the order of operation is. But basically, at some point in the sequence, Tower starts yelling at them to go around, go around, go around because you're about to hit the tower because they were off laterally separate. They were laterally deviated from the final approach course. And uh, as has been pointed out in people that have commented on this, the approach plate for the ILS to LaGuardia says no autopilot hand fly only just based on how the approach is. Now on a 737 in G, the captain has a HUD both sides i mean you're just flying off a flight director so it's not like a big deal to hand fly it you know it's you wouldn't be flying 737 I, I think southwest is the same at least at when i flew the 737 at our airline we weren't allowed to do cat three approaches to landing letting the autopilot do it because we didn't have it dual certified the captain would fly it to 50 feet on the rat out um via the hud are up, you know, 50 feet. If you didn't see it, you know, go around. But so I don't know what who's flying or, or anything like that. I thought we'd watch it. You're more current in 121 ops. We could talk to it. Barely. 
Yeah, it's like mine, none in four years. So, <laughs> so here is South Forty Tower, Southwest 147, ILS 4. Southwest 147, Southwest 147. Southwest 147. Southwest 147. So you can tell the male voice, you'll you hear a female voice later. The male voice is the one flying, or sorry, the pilot monitoring. He's not flying. Right. So, um, because that's just how it works. Usually yep. the pilot monitoring is the ones talking on the radio. Pilot flying is just focused on flying the airplane. So we don't know who was the captain or not. My assumption would be that the captain would be flying this, but 600 feet is not really, you know, I mean, that's You're not, right. in an airliner, that's not a big deal. Yep. Power JetBlue 2813 inbound for ILS 4. JetBlue 2813, the great channel, only four quid land traffic, on dish one three. Currently showing the uh, same speed as traffic, uh, 12 o'clock, three and a half miles an hour. Power four quid land, JetBlue 2813, Roger. Okay, here's the weather. Um, zero four zero at sixteen knots, so runway four, so right down the runway, one statute mile, heavy rain, mist, overcast at six hundred, two nine or seven nine or um so it's it's not great weather and no. the rain is not it's not a good thing. And this is a condition where you'd be cognizant of like a microburst, yep. you know, if it's heavy thunderstorm activity. Uh, wind shear, all that stuff. So it's it's all a bunch of stuff that's playing, but reduce visibility, re visibility that will suddenly and unexpectedly reduce because of where you are in that rain shower. Uh, does not seem and Laguardia short runway. So you know Laguardia is one of those ones where you back it down. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're you're not uh, you don't get the luxury of a, a nice smooth. Yeah, Southwest 147, we got to go around. Okay. Southwest 147, maintain 2,000 fly runway heading. Well, we're heading 2000 or something, 147. So this is their first go around. Southwest 147, when you get a chance, just let me know the reason. They want to know why. We're too fast, too high with the tailwind, Southwest 147. Got it, thank you. Which is what happens, right? Tailwind pushes you farther along the course. Uh, you're not getting slowed down. You still got to descend, so it's pushing you close, closer to that, um, that point where you have to be configured. I believe it's 1,000 feet when you're in the weather, 500 feet on a VMC day, so you have to be stable. You guys do that, stable target sync? Yeah, it's 1,500 for us. Oh, is it? Yeah, I think it was 1,500, but every airline could be different. That's not this one. 47, climb, maintain 3,000. So they're just going to get back, and back around. And you'll see here in a second, JetBlue is going to do the same thing. 47, maintain 3,000. Fly line heading and contact push 134.9. 3,000 runway heading 30, was that 34.9, 147? Yep, 134.9. See ya. I will say, too, from an airliner perspective, a go-around is not common. It is a, oh. there's a, so it's it's not like you're in your fighter and you just, you know, light the blower, pick up the gear and all that stuff. There is a lot going on when you do, when you actually do a go-around. And especially the busy airspace like LaGuardia, they're busy. So it's starting yeah. to add to their workload as they go, you know, and I, I preface that because, you know, what, what's going to happen here later, you can start to see the error chain kind of start to build, which we don't know why this happened. I'm not going to, you know, throw right. anybody under the bus, but they are vector vectored back around. I guess JetBlue didn't go around on this 40 one. Tower, Southwest 147, ILS 4. Southwest 147, the great tower, only four clear to land, only uh, four touchdown RVR, 6,000 rollout, 5,500. Clear to land four, Southwest 1. And that's not bad RVR. I mean, that's that's not terrible, um, but it's still raining. So you're probably thinking, oh, LaGuardia, I think it was a Flaps 40 landing. I think that's one of the places. And, dude, the 737 with Flaps 40, because that's all the flaps, it's a it's not fun. to. Fl I didn't like flying a, with Flaps 40. Hmm. So there's stuff going on here, right? They're not the only ones dealing with stuff. The, the JetBlue flight in front of them is now, you know, getting a low altitude alert, which means they're below where they're supposed to be on yep. the approach, and they're at a thousand feet. So they they probably needed to be uh, higher than that based on where they are on the approach. Tower JetBlue six ninety eight going around. JetBlue six ninety eight climbing two thousand fly runway heading. Two thousand runway heading JetBlue six ninety eight. So everybody's getting. JetBlue 698 coming 3,000. 
I say 3,000, triple 698. And they're going to say, say reason. And triple 698, when you get a chance, just give the reason for the mess. Uh, looks like we've got some wind shear, triple 698. Roger, thank you. Uh, contact first, 134.9. So this makes sense, right? They talked about the tailwind. They were getting slam dunked. It was hard to do. A tailwind that switches to a headwind. Sometimes you get wind shear conditions. Mm -hmm. If the uh, weather radar detects, is that how it is in the air? I'm, I'm assuming this is an A3. It's yep. an A320. So <clears throat> it'll yeah. give you a wind shear, wind shear, and you just have to firewall it and go. And you just go around, yeah. Yeah. Um, so at this point, you know, you're Southwest, you know, that the, the people, the, the plane in front of you just got actual, you know, wind shear conditions. Um, so you're almost ready to do, to go around if you're not already planning to divert somewhere else. Cause wind shear is not something we like to mess with. Cause there's been a lot of fatalities in, you know, aviation because of wind shear. Yeah. So, and it's, yeah. And so like I see in the comments, some people are asking about runway change. It's like a lot of times it's very common that the wind on the ground is not the same wind you're experiencing out on the approach here. So they'll be having a tailwind on the approach. And as they get lower to the ground, the wind shifts, hence the shear. Yeah. And you know, the, the headwind will go to a tailwind or a tailwind will go to a headwind, vice versa. It depends on where you're at, but prevailing okay. winds was favoring uh, runway four. Yeah. So there was no reason to change runways. Right. At this point, you're thinking changing airports. Yeah. You know, you're thinking <laughs> exactly. diversion because right. LaGuardia just ain't happening. Now, I don't know what the forecast was as to whether they were thinking then conditions were improved, but mm -hmm. if, if there's heavy thunderstorm activity such that, you know, the, the guy in front of me is just called out for wind shear. I mean, you, it's, it's, it's different from a wind shear alert. This is right. no kidding. Somebody experienced it and went around. Pardon. Mm -hmm. Top 147, let me know where you break out at. Will do. American 1263, look like that, 1-3, line up and wait, traffic lands 4. American 1263, runway 1-3, line up and wait. Alright, so here's the issue. Mm -hmm. You can see where he's supposed to be. The runway, you know, you can extend that out. And they're starting to deviate to the right, of course, which is where the, the terminal's right here. They're going to show a picture here in a second. Go around, go around. So I run the heading, climb maintain 2,000. Climb maintain 2,000, 2,000. So at the end of the runway, right here, they were at 200 feet, according to what their transponder says, you know, whether that's reporting correctly, not in any position to land and tower calls the go around. That's, that's pretty crazy on a, on a weather day like this, on a weather day like this. Now yeah. at 600 feet, they should be out of the weather. They should be now visibility wise. I don't know. They're hand flying this approach but they should have already been on the go around if they didn't see the runway unless they're like, uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, but, but I mean, we don't want to speculate, but uh, yeah, I, 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 this is, it's, it's tough to, I mean, I can understand deviating to the right. Of course, you know, I, I, you know, as you get task saturated or whatever, that's why you have two pilots backing each other up. But this is a, this is going to be a, a human factors thing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I mean, yeah, I, it's not the first time, you know, an airliner is lined up on a taxiway or maybe a road or something. I mean, you break yeah, out of the, if you've ever flown in hard IMC, right? We were like, when you break out of the weather, it's like, boom, there's a sight picture. You're like, okay, now where am I? <laughs> right. Um, I, we're all used to like being, okay, there's the rabbit lights. There's, a, there's the approach lights, runway environment site, but I, I don't know. Like I guess I don't um, want to speculate. I, I don't but, know, dude. If you look at the, the yeah, dots here, they I were know. right of course. Like, know. when did when they break get, out though? I, we don't know. But See. when you get to the the point of, I mean, you have to be stable. You have yeah. you have to be stable and what is it within a half a dot? Yeah. So like this this would have been a go around prior to that. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's the concerning thing is that it, that's why we do the, the, now if the navigation equipment's not working, right. Why were they you're still, but you're still cross tuned, right? So you're both yeah. sides are seeing their stuff yeah. and that's why they're backing each other up. That's a, it's just a tough one. To, I'm yeah. sure this will lead to a, some level of an investigation. We'll find out. Um, I'm going to 
Dude, that is right over the terminal. Continue climbing. Yeah. 7447, and uh, when able to pay reason, where you were like uh, not on the approach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So th this is telling the visibility has gone down. So maybe they were outside. You know, it, uh, you get to the. I, I could see this, right? You 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 get below the weather. Visibility is good where you are. You get into this rain band. You duck under. You, yeah, you lose that. You lose yeah. visual, and you're drifting because you're just not realizing. You know. Yeah, well, he taught like so. Brickyard goes around, and then then he's like, "Oh, I just went back to 6,000. I mean, so it's it's yeah. The weather. I mean, clearly the weather is is a major contributing factor here. Yeah, eight point seven. We're unable that uh, we're four thousand is the best we can do. Seven eighty four cancel approach clearance. Maintain three thousand slot runway heading. I cancel the approach clearance. Uh, three thousand runway heading. Brickyard fifty seven eighty four. Southwest one forty seven. You with me? Yep, just trying to work things out here. So the 147, we're climbing at 2,000, heading 060. Brickyard 5784, climb maintain 4,000, fly runaway, or fly heading at 040. 4,000, 040, Brickyard 5784. And of course, the RVR went up to 4,000 as soon as we canceled the approach back. HCS. Yeah, it's variable between the four, and now it's up to 45, and that's a rollout to 4,000. Yeah. The, Brickyard 5784. There's a lot of precipitation. Like they're getting they're getting schwacked with the, some serious rain and stuff. That's a significant offset, though. Yeah, I mean ILSs are are like the closer you get, the more precise it becomes. So it's it's. Four climb maintain four thousand. I tried to climb. We're climbing. We're here fifty seven eighty four. Okay, Southwest one forty seven. We're two thousand feet heading zero six zero. I'd like to uh, continue climbing. Yeah, just climbing to 2,000 and uh, giving contact approach 120.8. 20.8, so that's 147. And what were the reasons for the two go around? That's somebody else. That's not the right I was tag. not aligned with the runway at all. He was like east of the final. He was not going to land the runway. I mean, good on the tower, folks. Center southwest yeah. 147, 2,000 yeah. feet heading 060. Southwest 147, you have approach. Climb and maintain 4,000. Say your intention. 4,000, and uh, I guess bring us around one more time, and we'll uh, actually you can tell he's a little stand by. Okay, stand by. And approach right. southwest 147, we'd like to go ahead and divert to Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia. Uh, yeah. To Pittsburgh, or alternate. Pittsburgh. Southwest 147, Roger. And they end Pittsburgh up at Baltimore. Now via radar vectors. Uh, 5, Clear to Pittsburgh via radar vectors. Climb AK 5,000 southwest 147. South of 147, turn left, heading uh, 330. Left 330, Southwest 147. I would almost imagine she's the captain. I think she's the captain. Because it almost sounds like she's flying at, you know, the HUD, right? And because it was low visibility, you know, she's going to fly it. She's got the HUD. And when they go around, she's making the captain decisions of the diversion, and she's looking at her paperwork, and she's saying, hey, you have the aircraft. I'm going to work the diversion because we got to call the company. we got to, you know, we got all these things we have to do to divert now because the weather is not uh, good enough. Um, dude, I, I don't know. What It'll be interesting to see what, what comes out of it. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll hear about it because whatever the issue, you want to know, not so you can, like, bag on them because I've no mistakes. No. So we can learn from it, right? <clears throat> I'll learn from it. What happened? So I don't do that. That's <laughs> that's the selfish pilot in me, right? Yeah, and it, you know, like I said, I want to go back to we're not criticizing and throwing anybody under the bus. It's an interesting thing because it's a crew coordination thing. It could be something. I mean, there's all kind of failures that can happen. Now, granted, they are. I mean, it's do it's backed up. It's not just one system. There's there's multiple things that would have to fail. Um, for the system to be wrong, not to say that it never has, but dude, think about it as the passenger. I mean, you're going yeah. into LaGuardia. You've just done two go arounds. You heard the engine. They had to be toga. I mean, they had to be wide open. Oh, on yeah. You get a call like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were like, you know, hand, foot, throttle, like everything is going as far forward as it can, which pitches the nose because this is a 737, right? It's going to pitch the nose up. It's going to be a wild ride. And that's why they're like, hey, 
you know, yeah. and, and then there's already this media attention. Oh, yeah. Everybody, everything you hear is a 737, 737, and they're like, you know, you could just hear, you know, Ethel in the back. Well, I shouldn't have flown Southwest <laughs> Airlines on this 737. You know, I mean, it's, and then you end up in Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and everyone, as soon as they land, everybody gets out the phone. I was on a Boeing and we almost died. Yeah, almost exactly, died. dude. It's I saw the tower fly by my window. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, there there's probably a lot of turbulence. It's probably a bumpy ride. You know, if they're wind shear, there's gotta be turbulence. So oh, yeah, dude, hundred percent, man. I mean, <laughs> you don't have a smooth ride in the in the wind shear. Uh and then the tower people, I mean, that's not something you see every day, but like I said, good on them for paying attention. They broke the air chain. For sure, there was a phone call made. Oh, yeah. There was a, there were, so the thing, here's the thing that concerns me, and maybe it's me just superstitious as a pilot. You know, I always say, but for the grace of God, go I, because any of this stuff can happen to any of us, right? This is not, like, we're not immune. Mm -hmm. Error chains happen, and that's why we talk about them, and that's why uh, this happens, but we're either super lucky or the training is is going super well because we've had so many error chains lately yeah. that I am just I'm like worried that you know the next one won't be broken and and I I just don't know if it's just because the media like we're just paying more attention now or if there actually is something going on where we we as an aviation community need to step back and go dude we need a safety stand down because we cannot keep having these near near mishaps yeah uh i you're, you're right I, I my favorite saying is i i would always rather be lucky than good um i think yeah. it's a little bit of both man i think there's been some luck luck sprinkled in here and then i also think that the i'm not gonna say the training is excellent but i think it's adequate enough uh you know, and, you know, it always seems like in aviation, right? You'll have periods of like no issues. And then all of a sudden they'll just be like a rash of issues. I mean, you can look back, <clears throat> you know, as long as we've been flying commercial airplanes. I don't know. I agree with you. Uh, you know, if the commercial aviation industry, at least in the U S was like one big squadron, yeah. they would have a safety stand down for sure. Like, all right, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. yeah, stuff's falling off of planes. We're crash almost crashing into towers. Like, what in the hell's going on here? Um, yeah. it, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that there that there is an underlying thing going on, but I don't know what it is. I, mean, I have my own ideas, but I'm not gonna speculate. Yeah, I I just I mean, I will just say that what we just saw is very unusual. You know, and that's that's why it's noteworthy is because it's this is not something that you would see all the time now we weren't in the cockpit with them we don't know what was <laughs> going on we don't have access to the cvr we don't have access to flight data recorder focal data any of that stuff like there is a lot more information that i'm sure the company safety folks will find out use and debrief i mean dude you know i i've sat through you know i'm sure you have too you just did it in recurrent training where the company, you know, closes the doors, locks the doors, and they give you all the, the, they actually have the pilots, in, or at least on ours, they make a video, and they have the pilots talk through the near miss that they had and how they avoided or what they could have done better or situations where in the news it worked out fine, but when you close the door, you're like, hey, dude, we got lucky. We got lucky, and here's what we learned and how we get better next time. Yeah, that's one thing that really surprised me and, and like you said, uh, watching this surprises me in the sense that, you know, when I was, uh, in a fighter flying instruments, instrument approaches, I could, you know, the, the tolerances were actually pretty sloppy. Yeah. Um, I could fly an arc as fast as I wanted to. If I was going to overshoot, I'd squat the jet, right? Yeah. <laughs> even in, even in IMC, if I was going to blow an altitude, I'd roll inverted and pull that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> um, not 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 what you want but um yeah. <laughs> I, I mean i remember one time man as a, a you know i was a i was a nugget and you know the whole night approach of the carrier it's a giant instrument approach you you push off that altitude and you're supposed to push 
like within five seconds, I think from a very specific point. And I was late, dude. I had the burners kicked in. I was, <laughs> I was nearly <laughs> supersonic. Dude. Yeah. And I, and I'm supposed to be doing 250, right. And I tip over and I'm just, you know, I didn't, how I didn't crash mm. in the water. Like you said, God's grace. But when I became an, uh, got, you know, got 121 airline training, <laughs> those guys don't mess around. You yeah. get, you get like a nanometer past a half a dot and you're going around, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, and when you think about it, it makes sense, right? I mean, you well, got it's a, a bigger, of, yeah, big got, airplane, yeah. a lot of inertia. Not only that, but uh, it's kind of a PR disaster if you do happen <laughs> to crash one of these things. Uh, and you know, you got like, you know, men, women, and children, like you got families, grandmas, right? Dads, moms. Yeah. Um, so the, the tolerance for 121 operations at least where I'm at is like zero. I mean, you get, uh, yeah. you get anywhere near being unstable, which my Navy days, well, I, I could save it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just transitioned to a non precision <laughs> approach. <laughs> Correct. Yes, exactly, <laughs> dude. Um, so it does surprise me because, um, you know, I've been just a hair off on, uh, in simulator events and got told to go around and I do. Right. Yeah, I'm not all perfect, but, um, you know, in my mind, I was like, well, not bad, but whatever, you know, that's the tolerance with when you're dealing with, uh, yeah. Airliners. I think that no matter what happens, this will be used as a lesson learned. No, no, no. Like even if the, even if the pilots did everything correct, which I'm, it, they could have, if, if it was a mechanical thing, you know, there's going to be something that will at the very least apply to that company but more than likely can be used industry wide because maybe it's just a reminder. Maybe it's just a reminder right. like, Hey, we, we go around at, at, at this altitude for a reason. If you're not within the parameters, you have to go around. Don't try to, you know, the, the, what they, the look and see approach, you know, where you, <laughs> you pop out and you're like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I, like there's no room for that. Mm -hmm. And I think safety departments around the country and the world in airlines need to be foot stomping we cannot afford a mishap like no. the the fact that it's all in the news i mean that's hurting us a lot in general but the moment someone loses their life dude it is going to be bad it's 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 gonna it, it's we just we can't we've gone too long without it it's it's too delicate of a of, a, of this time right now and yep. we need to i mean as much as we can avoid it obviously some things are unavoidable but you got to be on your game. And now this could be a, a fatigue thing. You know, it could right. be a task saturation thing. Like there can be human factors that still not their fault. It's just, you know, Oh yeah. The Swiss Solid. cheese model. Swiss came, cheese, man. Yep. Came very close to lining up and <laughs> thankfully, you know, <laughs> the, the towers. Yeah. Yeah. Which has happened. I mean, remember San Francisco, Air Canada. Yeah. Th that dude was about to line up and land on a, a taxiway taxiway full of airliners that yeah, would have been what, worse than tenerife yeah that's what i was saying i mean we don't know right what they yeah. were seeing what they were i mean I, it's that so, one was different because that was the visual though i mean yeah. you know which this is a straight up ils uh in bad weather yeah even that man it's just it's hard you know how it is like yeah when you get in the airplane and you start moving at hundreds of knots and you throw yeah. in some weather and like you know second real, go around yeah real life stuff right um it just gets like, it just, it, you know, it's not black and white, man. Dude, I could easily see third leg, second leg, oh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. dealing with weather. You've already, yeah. you know, you probably took something happened. You were delayed before that's on your mind. You know, I mean, these human factors, things happen yeah. and it's our job to break the air chain. And luckily someone did. Yeah. That's, that's the lesson here. You know, someone did and let's figure out why this happened. Avoid it. Don't do it better. again. Yeah. Yeah get better at it all right man uh i'm going to turn this over to you as the mental health minute is now <laughs> run by gonky no it's actually all of us um i'll just i guess i'll just lead it and that's because this is not you know it's not my my idea so um shannon sent this to me last week and she's a she's a viewer and she it was her idea, the mental health minute. And she called it perceived loss of value or purpose when leaving the military. And I just, 
you know, I was like, well, what do you call that? Well, Hey, it's just, you know, value and purpose. And her example was, you know, she was, I think she made it up to an E4, right? She's in the military and she got out and she went to college and she just couldn't, she had a hard time fitting in, right? Because when you're in the military, it's, uh, it's regimented, so to speak. Uh, and there's, you know, there's mission involved. There's always mission on your mind, right? Like all military, yeah. uh, vets, all vets, uh, a lot of my friends that have gotten out, like I always see the struggle, like we're all mission driven, mission driven, but actually when you get out, you know, you should probably be family driven, but anyways. Um, so I took a look at that and I was, you know, I was thinking about it as far as like, you know, mental health. And I, so I come from a small town in Ohio and it's kind of, you know, Ohio's kind of the rust belt. And, you know, there's some factories there and it's a sad story. You know, we always talk about it. People will work in the factory for 40 years. They'll retire two years later. They're dead. Right. So what happens, you know, and if you, you know, if you dive into it a little bit and I'm not a psychologist, but you know, my dad's retired, he's 80, 82 years old. And he told me years ago, he's like, man, he's like, I'd give anything to go back to work. And I'm like, why? And he's like, it's just a reason to get up in the morning. <clears throat> you know, and I literally think a lot of people, um, uh, when they retire or, uh, in Shannon's case, you know, you, you leave the military and you go somewhere else and you, you don't fit in, you don't know how to fit in. You lose your sense of value and purpose. Cause it's like, well, you know, kind of what's, what's the point. Right. And that can, that can, that can lead you down to, that can lead you down a path. You don't want to go. I, I remember, you know, the commitment, has a pilot in the navies of 10 years. And I remember, you know, sitting around the ready room and there comes a point when we're all kind of talking about, Hey, what are you going to do? You're going to stay in or get out. And it's, it's always, you can tell it's like, and I experienced this too. It's the fear of getting out. What, you know, what will I, you know, what will I do? How will I fit in? You know, what, what is my purpose right on the outside? Now I'm a pilot, right? I go fly with the airlines. Well, I didn't want to fly with the airlines. Right. So when I get out, I got out, I didn't have an airline job or anything. I just got out. And, um, the, you know, sitting around, like, I remember one of the guys saying, you know, like, well, what do you do when you accomplish your childhood dream at 25, you know? And, it, you know, I, you think about that for a second and, you know, move right. Argue guys like you and I are extremely lucky. Right. I mean, my childhood dream was to be a fighter pilot. And I achieved that at 25. And then, you know, at 30 ish, it was like, do you want to stay here or get out? And, you know, I went through the mental gymnastics of like, you know, what should I do? Right. And then when I did get out, <clears throat> luckily for me, I shifted, you know, my purpose in life towards, uh, towards family. And, uh, you know, I was able to kind of get a handle on that, uh, you know, that, it's always a mental game on that mental game in your, in your head. But, you know, a lot of people, I don't know, like I said, I see it a lot back home, mainly with a lot of like my friends, parents and stuff that's, you know, that, that did a lot of time working, they retire a couple years later, they're gone. And it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like, man, when, when they quit the mental and the physical decline yeah. and, uh, you know, it's good to be aware of that. You know, like in her case, hey, how do you fit in? Well, you might not fit in, but I mean, there's going to be other motivated people in college. Like not everybody's there, uh, you know, to party, have a good time and be be undisciplined. I mean, there's there's groups and things and, and you can get involved with things outside of, you know, in her case, like college. Um, I like, you know, I, you know, getting involved with it with a good church is always good. Um, but I don't know, Mover, what do you think, man? Value and purpose, uh, you know with how it relates to, to, to mental health. And I mean, I, I think we can both agree that, um, you, you have to have a, I mean, you have, you have to be here for a reason, right? There has to be a purpose. Yeah. So I went through this probably twice, maybe three times. Um, cause unlike you, you know, I, when I was, I, you accomplish your dreams early and then what, but my dreams when I grew up was everything, you know, and I, I wanted to be, you know, fighter pilot was never number one on the list until very much later in life. You know, I wanted to be, you know, like a, a soldier, a ghostbuster, a firefighter, a cop, <laughs> you know, uh, like everything. If, if I wanted to do a lot and 
you know, you get sucked into, so to speak, being your identity, being your job, you know, your, your purpose is your identity. And you see that often, you know, the people that peak in high school, they wear their letterman jackets. And I've, I've made that analogy with fighter pilots and with military pilots in general, because I remember when I was a young Lieutenant in the squadron, I used to look at some of the dudes that would just never go home because they just like, they would finish working and their families were at home and they would just hang out in the bar and shoot their watches. Like some of that was cool. You'd learn a lot of stuff, but at some point you're like, dude, go home. This is right. not who you are. Right. And you just saw that, that if they didn't like, they had nothing else. Like that was their entire purpose and existence. And while, you know, it's funny because I didn't start thinking about this until recently, but while I was in, I was trying to find a ways out. Like I went and, you know, interviewed with the FBI. I went, you know, other jobs because I'm like, dude, there's so much more I want to do. But you don't get sucked in until it, you lost it or you're you're looking at losing it. And for me, it didn't really hit me until I left VFA 204 because I didn't leave on my own terms. You know, the medical thing and, you know, non-deployable. They said you can't be here anymore. And I went to kind of a non-flying deal because I didn't know if I was going to go to the Air Force Reserve or not. And I, the, the, luckily, the timing worked out that I went to the airline. And the first part, like airline training, 100%, I was on board. I was, you know, I was even telling T-Bear, I'm like, see, I don't want to go fly military anymore. This is my purpose now. You know, I'm an airline pilot. And of course, T-Bear, you know, pees in my Cheerios and says, well, you know, even a T-38 is better than flying an airliner. <laughs> and... and it wasn't until I actually started doing it and I start talking to some of these captains, you know, and I'm like, you know, I was 33 years old or whatever. I was, you know, a young first officer and, you know, they're talking about, yeah, back in my day, you know, I flew the Viper, flew the F-15, whatever. And I'm like, damn it, I miss it. You know, I don't want to, I'm a single seat guy, you know, <laughs> and dude, that put me in a funk yeah. because then even though my whole life, it was never all everything it started being my identity because I felt like I wasn't a whole person anymore. I, I wasn't who I used to be and I wasn't good enough and I didn't think I would ever do it again. And yeah. so I struggled with it. You know, I struggled with that confidence. I struggled with, you know, who am I? What's my purpose? And at the time I didn't really have a whole lot outside of it. You know, I was, I'd written some books, but they hadn't done very well. Uh, are they done? Okay. You know, I wasn't like the author, right? Right. And I was doing the sheriff thing, but I wasn't doing it that much. I was, you know, I'd do a parade here and there. I just, you know, it was a fun thing to do, but I wasn't doing much with it. And so when that lifeline came out and I went to the 301st and flew the T-38, it was like, at I remember driving to base. I was talking to Bucky, a friend of ours from, from 204. And I said, dude, he's like, I don't know why you're doing this. It's stupid. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> You know, you're going to be mad. You're going to waste all this time. You're going to lose all this money. Just stay with the airline. Keep doing it or whatever. I'm like, no, man, I have to because that's my purpose. I'm a fighter pilot. That's my identity. And he's like, dude, there's so much more to life than that. And I went there and at first it was awesome. And then, you know, the stuff, you remember the stuff that you didn't like. Oh, yeah. And then obviously, you know, the, the bureaucracy got me. You know, it got us. It got our positions. Oh, you know, yeah. it it ended before we wanted to. And I took the COVID leaves and I, I got away from the airline thing and was just doing that. And so of course it happens again, right? 2022 happens. Not only do we lose the funding, you know, you're never going to fly again, but then they, they came after me and, you know, personally came after me. And so like that attacks your identity too, because it's like, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I don't know who I am. I don't know what my purpose is. And I don't know where I belong because they have just ostracized me. They've just kicked me out of their club and said, I'm not one of them. And so it, it was tough. It was exactly, you know, that what you talk about where you, you, you go, well, what do I do with my life? You know, cause I, I hated the airline. I don't want to go back to that. Right. And I, I don't know what, what to do. And I've always felt what has helped me is turning a negative into a positive. And, um, two things that came out of that. The first one, uh, I had put off doing the field training program for the sheriff's office. And I started doing that just to get out of the house. I had a buddy of mine that said, Hey dude, you need to do this. You know, I'll help you. We'll get you, we'll get you, you know, back current and, and do it again. That was like the groundbreaking thing for me because it gave me perspective. It gave me purpose. 
and yep. it gave me the opportunity to 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 help somebody else in the worst time you know professionally for me then you know the the battle continued with the military and you know it just wasn't winning then we started this channel you know not this channel but this show and that kind of helped especially oh, when yeah. uh, you know you lose both dogs and now you're like dude yeah. i'm a dog guy what am, what am i doing here and then we turned that into something good because luna and i did the therapy canine program so and i'm not saying all this to brag about it what i'm saying is in times of identity lost in times of when you're feeling like you have no purpose you have to look within and go how do i make the situation better how do i turn a negative into a positive how do i let go of what i had and thought I needed and get something that's going to help somebody else. Because that is what helped me was the idea that I can take this adorable little dog and make her make somebody else smile, or I can right. go out and, you know, be the justice for somebody that I never got. And I did that, you know, with my current job, you know, military job, when I took that job, you know, being able to be a voice for somebody who has no voice sometimes will help you find that value and purpose. So long story or short story long, I think the answer to that question is you have to let go of a specific idea of who you think you are and just be open to what's next. Be open to the opportunity that presents itself because you will find purpose in something else that may not be what you thought in the first place, whether it's, you know, a volunteer organization, a church, your next job, you know, even something small, your family, which is big. I mean, family is a big thing. I'm right. not saying that's small, uh, but your dogs, you know, your pets, your hobbies, you can find like, dude, I just did it with this race car thing. I mean, who would have thought you could turn race cars into a, or an organization to help veterans with PTSD, you know, adrenaline therapy to get people with extreme anxiety from the, the wounds, the psychological wounds of their service and turn that into racing and having fun. Dude, they did it. And it was a fun weekend. I mean, that's one of the things that helped me two years ago. So, you just have to look and be open. And I think it's like we had an old squadron commander uh, from the two foots. Uh, you know, he always used to talk about improv. You know, you always say yes and, you know, the yes and this, you know, and then because you, you, you agree to whatever and then you add something to it. And that's just the improv. You improv your way until you find that new purpose and you find that next thing. So I don't know, man. G Doug, what do you got? This is um this is something we've been talking about in higher education for the better part of 20 years now. As soon as the first Gulf War started winding down and we started getting vets coming back to school, um it's it's been called transition stress in in the psychology mm -hmm. research. And um the kind of the good news is everything I just said, we've been paying attention to it, we've been doing research on it. The bad news is nobody's really figured it all the way out yet. Um, we've got a lot of predictive factors. We can say it's more likely for combat vets. It's more likely for enlisted. It's more likely for people who are hurt or wounded. Um, they're getting better at targeting what help is available to those populations. And one thing that emerges really clearly is something both of you touched on getting involved with a specific organization or a purpose or a value outside of the military. And religion is specifically mentioned in the resource in the research. That's my five minute thesis. Dude, I, I wish like we had Wombat because um, Wombat's a, another great example of this because, you know, not just with his career, but his participation in Wake for Warriors, mm -hmm. his job, <clears throat> his airline job and kind of how he, you know, did that and his devotion to his family. Yeah. You know, that is a guy that has has done everything and, and he would be a prime candidate, but he continues to keep moving and to keep helping people and to keep being, a, a you know, <clears throat> A good person. I, I guess it goes down, down to rule number one: don't be a douche. Yeah, it does, you know, dude. Don't be don't yeah. douche, dude. And, and dude, I think what's interesting is when you get to this point, when you create your own purpose, sometimes you let go of things that you thought. I mean, dude, you just did this. You know, you. I mean, oh, dude. <laughs> begrudgingly, but yeah. when, you, when you create your own value and your own purpose. Yeah you let go of the external things that 22 year old you would have, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Because yeah. you, you stop chasing the past and start looking forward to the future. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for that example, that for the email, you did it, you've been, you've been there and you, you've been there and done that. You've, you've, you have 
done everything you needed to do. Now it's time to start a new chapter, right? That next chapter of your life, it's going to be completely different, but that's <clears> the point. You know, it's, it's good to have new chapters that are different and exciting and, and not what you've been doing because nobody wants to, I, to me, there's nothing sadder than the, the stagnation of somebody who does, you know, who doesn't branch out and try to experience other things than just the one thing that they've always wanted right. to do. And then when they lose it, it's gone and they've got nothing left. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't live the same year over and over. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, no, that was good. Thank you for sending that. And, um, and on that note, <laughs> Hey, uh, mover and I are always open to suggestions of, uh, cool articles and <laughs> topics and stuff. So it actually helps us out sometimes because, uh, yeah, know, it does take time. Out. It does yeah. take time to put a show together. Donkey's got a Facebook now and an Instagram. Yeah, I do have the Facebook thing going because I kind of know how to use Facebook. <laughs> I, the, the Instagram thing, uh, I, I have an account, but I don't even know what to do with it. It's like, well, I, I have this Post account. pictures, dude. That's all you got to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. John says, just heard today is National Medal of Honor Day. Salute to all of our true national heroes. Uh, thanks for that. Big Cheese says, 15 years ago today, we lost David Cools Cooley in an F-22 flight test. I remember that mm -hmm. accident out of Edwards, small nickel in the grass. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Zippers Forever says, adjusting to being disabled at 51 was a gut punch. Five years and lots of therapy later, I'm living my best life as a professional ball thrower and servant <laughs> to Miss <Franca, laughs> the world's best rescue Malinois. And that is yeah. a beautiful girl. Uh, yeah, that's a good looking dog. That's yeah. awesome. Dogs can help, man. They dogs save lives. Yeah. The hardest part, he says, is learning to value yourself. That comes with therapy. Organizations allow us to substitute one organization for another. Use the org to put you on a path to therapy. And that's Wake for Warriors, mm -hmm. um, Battle Scar Motorsports. You know, like some of these organizations, you know, on on the surface, you might be like, what the hell are they doing? But dude, the camaraderie, like the the pitch for Battle Scar Motorsports, right, is that sense of belonging. So they take somebody that maybe you know not too sure their first time they've never been on a racetrack, and they they make them part of the team. It's like you're going to drive this stint, you're going to work on the car, you're going to help refuel. You know, oh it broke. Okay, we're going to help you know get this thing back running, and then it's the team effort to get it going, and get back on the track and stuff like that, which harkens back to their days in the military, which is you know pulled yep. together, win together, win together. Yeah, there's a the nice thing though is that at the end of the day you're not in the military anymore. You know, right. you go home and you've got new friends and not, um, I'll put the link in the, uh, description. It's our, uh, comments or Doug, if you'll do it, it's battlescar.org. Um, you know, if you guys want to participate, it's veterans and first responders that very cheap. I mean, the amount of seat time you get for the money beats anything on the planet. Um, you know, so it's, they also allow civilians to do it cause it helps defray costs. They just pay a little bit more. Uh, but they, you know, food, racing, all the equipment, all that's included. So I think it's a great deal. Uh, Laura says, it's okay to be unsure of your purpose. Figuring it out can be a process. Uh, it doesn't have to lead to anything profound. Yep. That's a good point. Uh, D. Stu says, I appreciate Movers openness to talk about the good and not so good that he's gone through. It really is going to help some people. Well, thanks, uh, D. Stu. I appreciate that. It's been a journey. Uh, Hidden Force says Wombat's tweets are always so motivational. And one day Gonky will tweet motivational things to you as well or at you. <laughs> <laughs> Kate says, yes, Wombat is a fantastic role model. I mean, he, dude, he's, I wish he, you know, he's obviously busy doing all of his busy things, but I wish we could have had him uh, tonight. Yeah. Jonathan says, mm -hmm. good stuff, gentlemen. There's a time and season for everything. It's okay and even good to live out multiple purposes throughout one our life. And then Kate says, life is a kaleidoscope. <laughs> With each turn of the viewfinder wheel, we can see and express new aspects of ourselves. Andrew says, mover, I need your shirt size. I have something for the mailbag. Oh, man, don't make me go to the post office. He's, an, uh, he's an XL with small arms. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we got man that's the end of this yeah that's awesome that's the, uh, uh hey tomorrow will be i allegedly I will be on casmo's channel oh dude i'm gonna heckle you from the comments you should yeah so it's gonna be fun 
Yeah, I'll Dude, be over on Casmos. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but we just did a three hour show and Wombat's not even here. I know. You know how I know? <laughs> the drink's uh, gone. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Luna gave up on me at the hour and a half point. She preempted uh, and then pieced out. All right. Well, that's enough. Doug, you got anything else, man? That's it for me. Thanks, Three Doug. attacks. You want to crap on lemons anymore? People have probably <laughs> forgotten since. Uh, I mean, I already voted ago. with my feet. I voted with my feet 10 years ago. There you go. Uh, with your wallet and your attendance. Support Battle Scarred. Support any charity you want. Just be generous with your time. And, you know, if you can financially, that's great too. But do something that's bigger than yourself. That's how I'll yeah. end tonight. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. We re really appreciate it. And, uh, for all the messages and stuff that email, you know, all the emails we get really appreciate that. And if we can work them in the show, we will. Like I said, it, it does help. Awesome. Have a good night, everybody. See you guys. Yeah.